This is three hours of the very best nuclear revenge stories of the past couple of months. Starting with this amazing one, in which a high school bully gets handed justice by his victim years later. Bully tries to act like it was in school. Guess I will tell on you then. In secondary school, I was tormented by a specific bully. For years, I was beaten up and publicly humiliated on a daily basis. The worst thing he did was beat me up so bad that I got a concussion and broken ribs when I was 14. He never faced consequences in school because his family was rich and he was pretty popular. For context, I live in a pretty small town in England, so everyone knows everyone, including the bully. He left the school when I was 17 and I didn't see him for about a year. Around this time, I got way more popular and started going to parties and making more friends. And annoyingly, he was friends with some of my friends and his girlfriend was at my school. But I managed to avoid him mostly until I finished. Unfortunately, I saw him a few months later. Me and my friends went to the pub to celebrate our exam results and he was a complete jerk to me. He started insulting me and mocking me to my friends, saying, why do you hang out with OP? Bringing up a bunch of stuff from years ago. And at one point, he put me in a headlock and told me that my friends only hung out with me out of pity. I wasn't going to take it, but I also wasn't going to get into a punch up because I didn't want to give him the satisfaction of getting me angry. And right at that moment, I overheard the perfect thing. He was bragging to his friends about the house party he was having and saying about all the substances he was going to take to the party, saying they were all in his car. Now, it wasn't just a few substances either. If I remember correctly, he said he had 13 bags of coke, about 30 pills and seven or eight grams of another substance. And then I knew at that moment what I would do for my revenge on the guy. As he was leaving, I followed him to his car and took a photo of his number plate. Then after he was driving off, I walked off and called the police. I knew they needed something more than hearsay to stop the car, especially as I didn't want to be traced back to it. So I told the police I saw him snorting a white powder in the pub toilets. This was a complete fabrication and then get into the driver's side of the car. I then provided them with the license plate of the car and I told him the direction he was heading in. I honestly didn't think they were going to stop him. Or maybe they would ask him questions later and ruin his party. But the driving on substances allegation, plus the fact he'd been arrested for minor possession before, which I didn't know at the time, was enough for the police to take this call seriously and stop and search his car. Of course, they found all the substances he was transporting to his party and he got arrested for it. The consequences of his arrest meant he lost out on his university place. His rich parents had enough of his behavior also, so they kicked him out and cut him off from their funds. And finally, a rumor I heard was that in turn for a lower sentence, my bully ratted out his supplier, which resulted in him getting stabbed multiple times. And as a consequence of that, he now has to wear a colostomy bag And that, plus his criminal record, means he's currently unemployed. Revenge is a dish best served cold. Mine has been cooling for 10 years and counting. I am a 40-year-old woman, and I've been married to my husband, who is 44, for 20 years now. We have two kids, a 16-year-old girl and a 13-year-old boy. My husband is what I would consider a high earner by middle-class standards. Also, strapping folks, this is going to be long. I've never told anyone, so here we go. 10 years ago, and by complete coincidence, I found out that my husband has been cheating on me with men from before we got married. We live in a smallish town in the south of the USA. Him coming out as gay will have consequences. I believe that that is the only reason he's not come out to anyone. First, here's how I found out he was cheating on me. He got sloppy. He left a credit card bill for a secret card in the pocket of a coat. While going through it, I found all the telltale signs of infidelity. Payments to a hotel in a nearby county, restaurant bills, gifts, flowers, condoms and lubricant, etc. I started camping outside the hotel on days he told me he'd be late, and I saw him bringing different men there. I am very good at compartmentalization and have a great poker face. It comes with growing up in an abusive household. So I was able to give myself the time to cool off and to come up with what I should do. First thing I did was getting an STD panel, since I didn't know how safe he was with his partners. It came out negative. Then I convinced him that we should use condoms, since I was having side effects from the pill. He was okay with it. I had a long think, and I came up with a decision that I was not going to confront him, nor was I going to leave him. He was able to provide me a really good lifestyle, one that I would never be able to afford with my high school diploma. That was a cleaning lady, a nanny to help with the kids, regular spa days and a country club, a new car every other year, luxury family vacations every year. 
He was a good dad, a good partner, cheating aside, and really good in bed. But I was not going to let him have a single guilt-free week in his life. That would be my revenge. I started small, planning great date nights for us, telling him that I felt our relationship has cooled, that I wanted the spark back. Then I'd sometimes slip into conversation some tea about a cheating husband, a gasp gay man that's been using his poor wife as a beard, complimenting the only gay couple we know for having the courage of being real men who were out and proud of themselves. On the other hand, I'd praise him as the perfect husband to anyone and everyone, especially if he was in earshots. The amount of guilt gifts I got was astounding. The man was even sending me flowers weekly. It continued the same way for years. I could literally see how much it was weighing on him. Me? Well, my parents were part of a commune with the concept of free love, and I was the same. I just considered myself in an open marriage. It seems that cheating is easy to ignore if you're not that big on monogamy in the first place. And my husband was keeping me satisfied, so I felt no need to find a partner of my own. Then, four years ago, I guess he met the love of his life. He started seeing just the one guy. I was seriously thinking of ending the whole thing, especially since I'd started a business by then and was able to bring in enough money to support myself and my kids while maintaining my lifestyle. But then he went and introduced his side piece to us. What? Wow. He freaking brought him into our house, introduced him to our kids, and that was enough for me to keep tormenting him. Apparently, he was a new friend he made while golfing. Oh my gosh, the audacity of that man. He started hinting at moving to another state, one where it would be easier for him to come out. I refused. I told him that my business was here and I was not going to start over in another state. Also, the kids had their friends and extended family here. It would be unfair to uproot them. Then he started trying to start arguments. I guess he wanted us to fight, then for me to ask for a divorce. I just stopped all those arguments in their tracks. I just agree with whatever he said. He was right, I was wrong. And to make it up to him, how about a nice dinner and some great sex? He hated that. I knew from spying on his phone that having sex with me felt like cheating on his boyfriend. The audacity of this man. Wow, that's OP saying that, not me this time. I also knew that his boyfriend was pressuring him to leave me almost every day. He was stuck between a rock and a hard place. He started drinking, and when it got too heavy, that was when I decided that enough was enough. I wanted to ruin his life, not his health. Also, I grew up with an alcoholic father and I did not want that for my kids. So I gathered all the evidence of his infidelity over the last nine years. Photos with different men, conversations, his grinder profile, even though he no longer had one, everything. Then I hired a divorce attorney and mailed the evidence to his employer. He has a morality clause in his contract and adultery breaks it. All his relatives, including parents, as well as our church, his actually, I was never big on religion like him. It was like a bomb exploded. He was fired. The congregation turned on him for cheating, not for being gay. Let's keep that straight. I'd never allow my kids to be part of a church that discriminated against their father, even if he wasn't out. His parents wouldn't take him in after I kicked him out and he was shamed publicly. Gotta love that small town gossip mill. And the cherry on top? His boyfriend was run out of the town and he couldn't follow him because he wanted to fight for custody of our kids. Now, almost a year later, I am a free woman. I got to keep the house, my car, and my business. He got 75% of the retirement and investment accounts, but he won't be paying alimony. I got full custody, he got visitations. I also got child support. He had to move six hours away to find a new job. Couldn't put the last job he worked at his whole life as a reference. His relationship with his family is rocky. His reputation in town is ruined, so he can't move back anytime soon. The love of his life left him for good. And my kids only tolerate him because I did my best to shield them and to tell them that he is still a good father to them. I also made sure to treat him politely. I never talked badly about him and had a lengthy talk about how their father being gay is okay. It's who he is and that it was not his fault. That the only wrong thing he did was hiding it from me. So I guess the results of his cheating was years of guilt followed by a ruined life. And interestingly, before I even get into my thoughts, I just want to read out this edit that OP has put at the bottom of the post. Let's make something clear. I am not the good person in this story. We were both bad. I'm not here trying to get pats on the back or to be told that I did well. I know what I did was messed up. I'm here because I wanted to tell someone and I can't do that in real life. 
And there we go. I think it's worth remembering throughout all of this that yes, as OP says, we, the reader, are the only ones that really know that OP knew about this the entire time. If you're coming from the perspective of her now ex-husband yeah she's got those old screenshots the grinder profile that was deleted a while ago but she easily could have just found that in the past few months from his perspective it looks as if she had no idea the entire time he probably thought he was getting away with it i mean i'm sure he did and yeah as op says a bomb exploded but he probably and everyone else probably thought that she just found out in the past few weeks and months there's no way that people would ever have thought that you'd known for 10 years and kept it, I guess, a secret in your own head for a decade. Now, interestingly, I wanted to read out that edit because OP is right, they're not the good person, but I don't think you're necessarily bad, right? Like, what are you inferring there? That you should have confronted him when you found out or that you should have divorced him? It's your choice. You're not the one that's doing anything that's wrong. I mean, like, I don't really know that you're necessarily bad there. Yeah, fair enough. You didn't do well out of the situation, but I don't think you can say that you were in the wrong. You had a good life. You wanted to maintain that. You loved your kids. You didn't mind the fact that this was going on. I mean, it wasn't enough to leave this man clearly right away. And there you go. You left him when you wanted to after 10 years, which is crazy. I will say though, it is nice that you said that you weren't the good guy in this because yeah, let's be honest. It is a bit shady, whatever you did here, not outing the situation. But still, good stuff from you. Okay, then let's move on to our second nuclear revenge story now. And this is where things get a little bit more serious. Guys, if you are listening to this and not watching on YouTube, just a word of warning, I'm going to have to change quite a few of the words here. And there's going to be a lot of censoring. But here we go. Try to publicly mess with my relationship and lie about illegally touching me. Congrats on your relapse. First of all, some background. I grew up with a big group of family and friends. Our summer houses were all near each other. We all went to the same schools, call each other's parents, aunt and uncle, etc. My brother and I, though, always felt we were slightly left out. Outsiders, black sheep, if you will. One of the girls, Claire, assaulted me twice when we were kids. I was eight or nine years old. Once at a sleepover and once at our summer home. I didn't dare bring it up because it would absolutely blow up our little community. And because of that outsider dynamic, everyone would absolutely choose their side. This was before her dad died. But after that, you can also imagine how much sympathy her family garnered. So I ignored it. I never forgot it, but I only told friends completely separate from our community when I was older. I also sort of pushed it aside until the past few years when my therapist finally got me to realize that all because she's only two years older than me, doesn't mean that what she did was okay. A few years ago, she randomly got really cold towards me. Now that we're adults, we only see each other every few years anyway. I just thought it was strange since she always did it blatantly in front of everyone else, but no one seemed to care. Her mum and sister treated me the same. Then my mum was completely shut out of any of Claire's wedding events, which destroyed her feelings and made me hate her even more. My long distance boyfriend came to meet everyone for the first time. For visa reasons, we were going to start the marriage process a little sooner than we originally planned, but it is what it is. So my boyfriend was planning on asking my dad for my hand at the end of the trip. I only told one other girl about it, who I'm closest with, but she obviously blabbed. While all the kids were hanging outside and the parents were inside, Claire accidentally mentioned it in front of everyone, including my brother. Some of the parents overheard from inside. Now I have about 25 people in our private business. Claire was so obviously pleased with herself. My dad can be kind of reactive when he's not expecting something. So the publicity of this made him even more frazzled. And when we brought it back to the house, everything was basically ruined. He was flustered and started going on about how it's too soon. It had been a year and a half and wouldn't listen while we tried to calmly explain to him that the fiance visa itself can take up to almost a year. My boyfriend and I are fine and still together. It's just something that obviously should have been between us and my family and gossip started flying. We go home, life goes on, yada yada. Fast forward a few months and I have to see her when she's in town and I'm at a get together with some of the kids who also live in my city just the two of us and she accuses me of assaulting her i'm genuinely shocked she said she doesn't have the heart to blow up the community right now but laughed at me when i reminded her that it was actually her and suggested that this info might come out whenever my wedding may be this sort of made me spiral for a few months i wasn't sure if i was remembering it the wrong way or something 
sobbing, imagining how I was going to explain it to my boyfriend and if he would break up with me. I even started seeing my therapist twice a week, where she made it very clear that what I was describing was not a false memory at all, and she was 100% confident this actually happened to me. And apparently, Claire turning it on me isn't uncommon. A very important piece of information, Claire is a coke addict. Massively, massive cokehead, doing lines to start the day cokehead. Went to rehab where she met her now husband. Yeah, she's been sober a few years, but she looks absolutely horrendous. I used to do it recreationally. I quit a little while back. I just really hated the come down. So we see everyone a few months later. We're all hanging out at her family's summer house. When we're alone, she hints at DMing my boyfriend before the weekend is over. Obviously not knowing that he's already in the loop. I walked out, I was so angry and decided I'd start getting ready for bed. I went to the bathroom and I packed my toiletries in a bag that I hadn't used in a long time where I found a baggie of old Coke and her toiletry bag was also in the bathroom. I snapped. I took the baggie, sprinkled a little bit on her toothbrush, chapstick, and mixed some into the oil she uses for oil pulling before leaving the ensuite bathroom and slipping the baggie into a pocket in her purse. And it happened. Exactly what you'd expect. I don't know when she found the baggie, but two nights later, when she said she wanted to go on a walk alone, I knew she was going to meet a dealer. A week later, she overdosed, went straight from the hospital to rehab, and apparently her husband is considering at least a separation. I broke down and told my boyfriend. I wouldn't say he was pleased, but was surprisingly supportive and said if anyone deserved it, it was her. I realized then that I actually didn't feel bad for doing it. I was just scared that it was going to cost me my relationship, but it didn't. My dad is now on board since we've been together a little longer and we filed the visa paperwork. I probably won't see her for a few years and I'm not sure if I'll let her know subtly what I did, but screw you, Claire. The next time we see each other, definitely won't be at my destination wedding. Well, guys, if you thought the first story was pretty crazy, um, how about getting an ex-drug addict back addicted to coke? I mean, that is a definition of nuclear revenge, I will say. Unbelievable. I don't even know what to think about that. <laughs> I mean, the thing is with the first one, right? OP said, I know I'm not the good guy here. Now, in the second one, there's not even a, a hint of an edit, a hint of remorse. It's just, yes, I know what I did was so bad and I don't even care. And my, and my boyfriend supports it as well. My fiance now, nuts, absolutely nuts. Wow, I mean, dabbing it on a toothbrush to get someone re-addicted. My word, that is the level here, my friends. That really is nuclear revenge. And now for our final story of today's episode, potentially the most serious yet, as well, it does involve multiple illegal things, including murder. Here we go. My family murdered an R word. Now, just to confirm what this R word is, it's someone who has done something illegal, assaulting someone without their consent in a certain sort of way. I mean, you can probably work it out, guys. This is my grandfather's story. It would have occurred sometime in the early 1960s. My grandpa comes from a very remote part of my country. Even in the 60s, they lived in a log cabin without a phone or electricity. He lived with his three brothers, his sister, his father, and his mother. It was a violent household. My great-grandfather was an alcoholic. My grandpa, his siblings, and his mother were accustomed to beatings. The culture of the time was to accept this as a harsh reality of the remote and difficult lives that were led so far from civilization. My great aunt was the youngest of the siblings, and as my grandpa and his brothers grew into young men and began working, she was left at home and began to take on the role of housekeeper as my great grandmother was often ill. She would often use her bad health as an excuse for not stopping what happened next. My great grandfather began aring my great aunt at some point most likely before she'd even begun puberty. Oh my word. It continued for years as her brothers all moved out and she was left completely alone. My grandpa says he truly did not know. He worried for his sister, receiving the brunt of the beatings, but he didn't know about this. I hope that's true. When my great aunt was 13, she became pregnant with her father's son. Oh my goodness. I, I thought this story couldn't get any worse. My word. The night my grandpa found out, him and his brothers snowmobiled out from town. And since none of them owned a gun, they had to use shovels to beat their father to death. The ground was frozen solid, so they burnt him, which also helped to destroy the evidence, I suppose. 
Although I'm not sure anyone ever questioned how my great grandfather had died, these were very different times. My great aunt's son, born of incest, is afflicted with genetic issues. He can barely see and he only has a single functioning kidney. But he is happy and has healthy kids in their 20s now. My great aunt drank herself to death in the 80s, as did my great grandmother, so I never met them. My grandpa told me all of this when he was drunk, as he's also become an alcoholic. And so has my dad. The generational trauma of my family is thankfully now broken with me and my siblings. But this revenge murder, this disgusting hurt, was really just another sad piece of a puzzle of abuse that started long, long ago. Um, wow. There we go. I'll be honest, the first story in today's episode, yeah, it was over a decade, but it was pretty timid, you know, for nuclear revenge this is. Nothing that's like crazy illegal, just cheating, realizing that someone's cheating on you with another man, tough, but you know, that sort of stuff can happen day to day. Second story, um, a little bit a little bit more crazy there. We're getting some some uh, some lovely illegal substances involved and we're getting someone re-addicted to those substances pretty nuts and definitely nuclear as all these stories were the third story though wow like i don't even want to go into what i've just read there unbelievable stuff i think that actually might be one of the most severe nuclear revenge stories that i've read like the r alone was nuts then the fact that she was 13 then the fact that she's got pregnant because of him i mean i guess it's to be expected right oh what Oh, I just don't... Let me know in the comments right down below. How are you actually feeling right now after reading that truly gruesome tale? I feel a little bit less like... Uh, I don't know how to feel. Wow. I, a 43-year-old man, slept with my former Karen friend's 23-year-old son. Now, I don't normally do this, but for this story, I think it's important that we do read the cast. So, OP is a quirky, creative movie geek. Molly is a mean-spirited, insecure, hateful, jealous, wannabe actress, writer, whose only real work of fiction is her resume. She is also the Karen of this story. Matt is Molly's overgrown, coddled, spoiled man-child of a son. And Hannah is Molly's misanthropic, introverted eldest child, seven years Matt senior. More than 20 years ago, I was once a very green and new writer, now a successful published writer in the independent film world. I was barely 21 when I met Molly, then in her early 40s when I was networking to get my very first screenplay, a murder mystery, into production. Being the broke college student that I was at the time and new to the business, I had no contacts. There was no social media, nor were there any guaranteed ways to meet like-minded individuals to guide me through the arduous, ugly business of beautiful people known as the film industry. Along came Molly. By her claims, she was a seasoned former theater actress and aspiring writer. To my untrained eyes, her resume was quite well written. According to Molly, she had put her ambitions on hold to get married and start a family. She was also a former fashion model and, now that her children were older, was just starting her film career. As someone who had no experience, I was in awe listening to all of her, I later found out to be highly embellished, tales of working alongside some of the great ones. I thought Molly had thrown me a lifeline. Little did I know, my long nightmare had just begun. To make a long story short, Molly promised to help get my work produced into a feature film. I was ecstatic. She said all the right things and hit all the right notes. She tried to present me with a contract that she expected me to sign. I saw a series of typographical errors and misspellings. There were simple grade school level words misspelled. No aspiring writer would have made quite so many errors without, in the very least, proofreading what they considered to be a professional document. It's worth pointing out, the document wasn't even notarized or on official letterhead. I also later came to find out that her production company name wasn't registered with the state and that she'd simply made it up. Having recently copyrighted my then one and only screenplay, even I knew it needed to be notarized in order for the document to be legal. My gut told me not to trust her. This was way before Zoom meetings, back in the days of when snail mail and fax machines were largely used. Let's just say her attempts at scanning the document and sending it to me did not go over well, as she was not computer literate at all. Put it this way, she was the type of person to do an internet search of her email address. Yet another red flag. When I said no, her mask slipped. What I saw beneath was, honestly, quite terrifying. A hateful, arrogant, jealous, overgrown middle school mean girl who never matured past the adolescent bully mindset. 
I ended the call and turned into a bloodhound. I called up all her references on her resume and researched her work history down to the last credit. Surprise, surprise. Her resume was more phony than her, what would later be known as, Karen Platinum blonde hairdo. I pushed back and told her I wasn't going to sign the contract and there was nothing she could do about it. Mostly because she'd lied to me and I found out she wasn't as experienced as she said she claimed. To say she didn't take this well would be a gross understatement. She promised that she would produce my screenplay into a feature film whether I liked it or not. When I pointed out to her that that constituted theft of intellectual property, plagiarism and copyright infringement, all crimes that I could sue her for, she went radio silence quiet. I later found out through the grapevine that she was demonizing me to anyone who would listen thus adding slander and libel to the list of crimes that she committed against me. She, without my consent, even went as far as to get a promotional video done loosely based on my story, with her, naturally, starring in the leading role. I tracked down the filmmaker's website and saw an edit of the video on their demo reels page. It should come as absolutely no surprise, Molly's performance was stiff, awkward, mechanical, and would have looked out of place in a prawn film. It completely contradicted her claims that she had 20 years of experience on the theater stage. It's also worth pointing out that during our shop talk discussions, she didn't even know the difference between a soliloquy and an aside. Even high school sophomore English students know what those two terms mean. I gathered piles of evidence against her, and in the process of doing my research, it was a file that was at least 10 inches thick, I learned I was not the first person she tried to screw over. If it isn't clear already, Molly was a total narcissist. She had no respect for boundaries, zero comprehension of the word no, no accountability, and never thought beyond the moment. Therefore, she had no expectation or understanding that there are reprisals and consequences for her actions. To say I was livid upon learning that Molly had stolen my literary property and tried to turn it into her own little vanity project would be sugarcoating it. I decided to contact the director and producers directly. I scanned my copyright certificate and sent a very eloquently written email to them declaring that I was the sole creator, owner of the work that Molly had presented to them. It should come as no surprise that she had claimed she'd written it and was going to produce and star in the feature film based on it. The documented proof that I sent the director and his production team completely refuted her fraudulent claims. I really don't know what Molly hoped to achieve by doing any of this. As anyone who knows anything about the seriousness of copyright laws knows, she would have had to prove proof of ownership when it went to production. Of course, she was incapable of proving such proof as it did not exist. A zero budget promotional video based on her written work was a different story. It was a labor of love for everyone involved. As for Molly, it was just a temporary stroking of her very fragile ego. I was just sad for the cast and crew that their time had been wasted by a skilled con woman who lied every time she opened her mouth and would have sold her own children up the river if it could have gotten her what she wanted. To make an already long story much shorter, Molly called me up flipping out when everyone on the production team quit. Why she thought I would care about her being rightfully branded a charlatan, I'll never know. She never said it, but she knew that I knew she'd been busted for her series of copyright violations. They'd also apparently questioned her resume after the fact and called her a lying grifter with zero skills or talent. Apparently, she did not take this well and she cussed them all out. Having seen her true colors, they distanced themselves from her. I can only surmise that they, at the bare minimum, did not want to be involved with someone who was a proven liar and a thief. Word traveled and Molly became a pariah in her state of residence. In my last phone call to her, I granted her one last concession. I told her if she wanted to salvage anything resembling a career, she would have to move far away where no one knew her. Last I heard, she ticked off well over 100 people with her unethical, immoral, unprofessional, and downright illegal business practices. She'd made her bed of nails and was forced to lie in it. Flash forward to present day. I'm actively working in the local film industry of my current state. I decided to go out with some of the crew and cast of a project I was working on. We went to a gay bar. Yes, I'm out and proud. The city we were in is very liberal and open-minded. The club was amazing, as was the drag show. I saw this young man at the bar with sandy blonde hair, a chin strap beard, and beautiful hazel eyes. He was pretty toned too, with a forearm tattoo of the US Navy insignia on it. Being an Air Force veteran myself, we started talking military stuff. I thanked him for his service. I asked him to let me buy him a drink, and he obliged. 
I asked him his name. He said, Matt. Since this club let anyone in that was 18 or over with a valid form of ID, I wanted to make sure he was legally old enough to drink before I bought him that beer. I kindly asked him to show me his ID and he complied. I was surprised that he did as he didn't have to. I saw his first name was in fact Matthew, his middle name Joseph. His last name, a distinctive moniker that I would not share here as that would constitute doxing. I saw his birthday and I remembered that Molly's son had the exact same date of birth. Naturally, being Molly's son and his mother being married to Matt's father, they all would have the same last name. I suddenly realized that this was the son of that same horrible woman who at one point made my life a legal living hell. It had been many years since we'd seen each other. Matt didn't recognize me. My appearance had changed quite a bit. I neither had bushy shoulder length surfer dude hair nor wore contacts. I'm in the best shape of my life as I work out five out of seven days a week. I have a clean shaven head and I wear glasses now. Since I do have an acting background, I was able to hide the shock of this strange coincidence. That the formerly ill-mannered, bratty, poorly behaved holy terror that was Molly's son had turned into this strapping 23-year-old, six-foot-tall, sexy, well-toned twink with a reddish-brown beard. Him being in a gay bar was the ultimate irony and icing on the cake. As Molly was, when it was convenient, a huge Bible thumper. We both drank for at least another hour while we talked. We were enjoying each other's company and had lost track of time. By the time it was last call, both of us were buzzing, but didn't want to risk getting a DUI. We decided to Uber over to a nearby hotel. We checked in, went to a room, and it only had one bed. Awkward. I said I would sleep on the couch. The air conditioner had made the room really cold, and he asked me to sleep in the bed for warmth. I knew what he was suggesting. I just didn't expect him to be so overt about it. Then again, his mother wasn't really known for having tact either. I told him that was up to him. I was a hot sleeper and a plan to sleep in my underwear. I started stripping down to go and take a shower and he commented on my builds. Matt blushed. You look really good. You must work out. I ignored the obvious come on. I smiled. Thank you. I do at least five times a week. I also try to watch what I eat, but my weakness is salt and vinegar chips. Matt laughed and smiled a come hither grin. I'm not in near as good a shape as you. Don't say yourself short. You're taller than me, I said. Matt laughed at my bad pun. All right, guys, a little bit of a fair warning here. It does get a little bit raucous in this moment. I'm going to read it out because it's in the story, but, you know, fair warning. If you want to skip ahead a minute or so, be my guest. I I won't stop you. OP then says, well, don't leave me in suspense. Let me see what you look like. I've shown you mine, show me yours. I said this with a sly smirk on my face and I shifted my eyebrows. I think he knew what I was suggesting. The next thing that happened, I did not expect. Matt completely stripped naked. Now it was my turn to blush. Okay, that was definitely an icebreaker. Matt took a step towards me and rubbed his hand over my chest. We don't have to do this, I said to him. I want to, daddy, he replied to me. Sorry, I can't help but laugh here, guys. Remember throughout all of this that Matt is Molly's son. Matt just doesn't remember who OP is in this moment. But OP sure knows who Matt is, and this is all part of his revenge. Now, OP hates being called nicknames like that, but I let it go. Because, let's face it, I had this cute college-age kid in my hotel room, and that was the only thing on my mind at that particular moment. I was fully out of my clothes and standing in front of him as we inched over to the bed. He laid me down and kissed me while caressing my chest. I'll spare you any of the squishy details, It happened. It was amazing. Matt chose the top bunk. The finishing move, I would give a four out of five stars. He was clearly inexperienced and could definitely use some practice, but it was fun. Now, good news, guys. That is the end of the Wattpad story. Let's get back into it. The next morning while he was showering, I went through his phone and got Molly's as well as his sister Hannah's numbers. I'd seen him put in his passcode, his birth year, so it was easy to remember. Without getting too graphic, during the act, Matt had taken pictures of us in various positions, doing things to each other. Okay, sorry. Seems like the raucousness has continued a little bit. No, it wasn't for an OnlyFans. Wow. We were both consenting adults, and I had no problem with that. I'm debating whether or not I should send the pictures to his dog mother and equally horrible half-sister, Hannah. Because I'm not a petty, spiteful, cruel individual like Molly, I'm stuck at a moral impasse. I'm really on the fence about it. 
How would Molly react if she found out that her pride and joy, whom she'd beautified and practically canonized as a child, was a raging member of the LGBT plus community? Not that having a gay son should ever be considered a form of punishment, but Molly being the racist, homophobic, bigoted, feckless, Bible-thumping, adulterous hypocrite that she is, I'm sure it would come as a big shock. In comparison to Molly, Matt's father was always more liberal-minded, easygoing, and just wanted all of his children to be happy. He had three others with his first wife before he met Molly. I'm also pretty sure that Hannah wouldn't care at all about her little brother being a great big flamer either. If anything, I'm sure of one thing. If and when Matt comes out, he's going to see how very conditional his mother's love for him, if he doesn't even know that already, is. As a child, Hannah and Matt often went hungry, wore ill-fitting clothes, shoes that didn't fit, rarely had supplies for school, had teeth rotting out of their heads, and lived in a house that looked like it belonged on hoarders. Molly, on the other hand, always had her hair done, her nails done, booze in the fridge, and a full pack of cigarettes. It's the important things that matter, right? And there we go. That is the conclusion of that story of revenge. Not entirely sure what to think about it. It was extremely well written. I did enjoy reading it, apart from maybe the, the Wattpad moment in there. Not entirely sure that was necessary, but hey, I, I can never say that too much description is a bad thing. Maybe in that situation it was. I don't know. Good story though. I enjoyed it. Guys, what do you think? Did that revenge justify itself? Was that good enough? Was it even apt? Was it revenge at all, really? It seemed to me as if OP kind of wanted it to happen anyway. You know, it wasn't really revenge as such as maybe it was just you happened to come across a guy that you fancied and he just so happened to be the son of a horrible woman that you met in your past and that didn't really do the nicest of things to you and tried to steal your script. I don't know. I guess I'm trying to say that I think you would have just got with him anyway, right? Even if you didn't know who he was. Now, with that all being said, comment down below, guys. Do you think that OP should send those photos? For me, I just do not see that as necessary at all. I don't particularly think that stealing a script should lead then to <laughs> the person's script that you stole sending photos of them with your son in some pretty uncompromising positions let's just say that to you i don't really think that's justified but hey maybe i'm being a little bit too lenient get in the comments down below what do you think should op send those pretty raunchy photos um and if you don't send them to karen hey we can always send them to me my friend don't do that Please. Ex-boyfriend violates me and denies it. I ruin his life. At the beginning of these events I'm about to share, I was 20 years old. I'm now 21. I was involved in a five-month relationship with my ex-boyfriend, Jack. He was also 20 and is now 21, who attends the same school as me. We started dating in December and I broke up with him in May. At the time, I was taking a gap semester from school for previous unrelated reasons to the events being told here and was instead working full-time. We went into this relationship both as each other's first. We were also subsequently part of leadership in a student-run group, with both of us being elected shortly before I broke up with him. This is a story of what happened in this relationship, as well as afterwards, that subsequently resulted in me ruining his life. I toyed with keeping this story to myself, but the closure from my experience includes getting it off my chest. And maybe some internet strangers can help me feel a little better about everything that happened. I won't go overly specific to try and spare my identity, hence the throwaway account, but anyone who knows of the fallout probably knows who I am. To those, I stand by my actions. And if my ex is reading this, you deserve so much worse than what you got. You are subhuman scum. So then, parts one to three provide context and a backstory that were abbreviated to get the gist across. And part four and five is where the revenge starts. Part one, the start. I did not know Jack at first before we started seeing each other. A mutual friend, Bestie, introduced the two of us because we shared similar interests. We hit it off and went on a few dates over the span of a few weeks. One night, Jack came to my place. We watched a movie and cuddled through the night. This was what I consider the official start of the relationship. We were seeing each other pretty much daily, even when he went home to visit his family. I lived within reasonable driving distance. The relationship moved in a way I consider relatively quick in hindsight. He also gaslit the words, I love you out of me 
two weeks in by a misshaping words I spoke into the phrase Jack also mentioned shortly after we started dating that he had a previous ex in high school who was closeted But the details I have are relatively faint. They were all disclosed by him He mentioned that this relationship abruptly ended when the high school ex accused him of the r word Telling his friends his high school admin and his family This reportedly drove my ex to therapy and ruined his social life My ex swore up and down that he would never do such a thing to anyone But wanted to be upfront with me at the beginning Though we were pretty much exclusive at the time he disclosed this I, obviously taken aback by this Didn't think that he was capable of something like that And I told him as such And I comforted him for sharing such a vulnerable experience with me I largely forgot about this afterwards though Part 2 The Relationship When I first started dating Jack, we discussed our preferences, what we were looking for, the standard relationship spiel. He told me that he was looking for someone masculine and I told him I wanted the same. We both assured each other we were masculine figures, but only one of us was telling the truth, which I'd come to find out during the relationship. He was honestly quite femme presenting. He would say things even before we started dating that in retrospect seemed somewhat off-putting or outright manipulative without raising red flags at the time. Again, this behavior became habitual throughout the relationship. Shortly after I started dating him, I joined a student-run design group that Jack was a prominent figure of. I've been exploring joining this group or one similar to it, but dating him at the time gave me the confidence to move forward with it. I didn't play a huge role in it initially as I was working full-time, but I began making acquaintances with those in the group as I was generally regarded to be a friendly face. Jack had acquaintances in this group that he would make comments about that were vile and sexual in nature. One of them was a mutual acquaintance of the both of us, and the things he would say made me question whether Jack was aware that we were in a monogamous relationship. These comments seemed to be attempts to invoke jealousy to me, but I never gave in. However, they only perpetuated the red flags that he was giving off. Part three, my own doubts, the break, and the breakup. I would argue my doubts began sometime around month three. Some of the doubts that I felt involved the deepest questioning of my sexuality in my lifetime, as well as whether I was truly attracted to Jack. I had a few people in my life that I'd been attracted to for a while, and intruding thoughts of me being with them began to run through my head. The red flags Jack displayed began to illuminate in my mind, and slowly these doubts I felt began to affect the relationship. I'd never questioned my sexuality severely as I kind of always knew that I was a gay man. I realized that I was starting to lose the spark that I thought I'd felt towards Jack when we first started dating. He also started to become more aggressive in initiating slash when I turned him down. One time when I declined, he angrily looked at me and asked me if I was sure that you're still actually gay. This question rubbed me the wrong way because I'd long since shared my story with him about the discovery of my sexuality. I'd known I was gay for nine years at the time, though I'd only been out for two years. Needless to say, Jack slept alone that night. I worked to mend my side of the relationship, though there were many challenges to overcome. The gap in compatibility was quickly growing evident between the two of us and started causing tension. I had mentally begun to exit the relationship as I was beginning to feel guilty for not keeping him happy. Jack was also insistent that I quit my full-time job so I could go back to school and properly focus on it. And the job had started to demand more from me, up to 10 hours of overtime per week sometimes. I was steadfast on staying employed. I was a manager of a place I'd worked at for five years and this furthered the tension as he felt I was choosing work over him. Around the end of April, there were elections being held for leadership on the design team that Jack and I were now both a part of. They had an empty position for their treasury role for which I had experience with my job. So I ran for the role and got it. He'd been gunning for a project management role and was given it as well. This happened in conjunction with the relationship turning rocky, but it didn't seem like it would be a problem. It's important to note that this design team was quite important to Jack. He put a lot of time into it. It was his main thing outside of school and almost all his friends that he had were in it. I wanted to make sure that I could help this continue to thrive for him. So I kept trying to mend the relationship, though it was slowly wearing me down. Okay, guys, before we get into this next section, I just want to give you all a trigger warning of assault that is about to occur. One morning in early May, as I was sleeping at Jack's apartment, Jack attempted to make a move on me at 3.30 a.m. I, asleep at the time because I had work at 7, told him that I didn't want this and turned back over and went back to sleep. This seemed to stop him, but only temporarily. I stirred again at about 5.30 a.m. because I felt something on me. 
Jack was now on top of me. I tried to fall back asleep, but he continued, then proceeded to finish on top of me. I, disgusted, got out of bed and showered to get ready for work. He didn't say anything to me in this time frame, not even an apology. As I was about to leave his apartment, he stopped me and said that we should take a break. I tearfully agreed and left for work feeling like I'd done something wrong. The break was mentally relieving and challenging for me. I felt right being apart, but didn't feel right about everything that happened. I was still questioning my sexuality and was facing ever increasing challenges with work. I was tasked with managing two departments at once and worked almost every day during the break. I didn't talk to any of my friends about the break because I felt like I was the one that caused it. A few days later, Jack called me because he couldn't stand not being with you and wanted to be together again. I reluctantly eased back into it, but I'd mentally known the break was the beginning of the end. At this point, he'd moved back with his family about two hours away for an internship. So this post-break relationship was basically long distance. We talked and I told him I was going through tough times with work to try and justify my off behavior. And he began texting me sappy daily messages to which I largely ignored because they felt shallow and only made me feel worse. I responded to some of them and I'd pick up his phone calls, but this was mostly an effort to show that I was still alive and somewhat engaged in the relationship. On a Saturday morning, Jack called me super early and left a voicemail to the tune of an ultimatum, asking whether I was willing to make things work or if he needed to move on. This call was the final straw for me. I knew that this was when I needed to end it. I wrote a brief letter, called him back, and I read it to him. I broke up with him over the phone. This was not my finest hour, but he left me no choice. He was entirely taken aback by me calling the relationship off and tried to ask me to make it work manipulatively. I ended the relationship amicably because I thought I'd done something wrong and he agreed that we could remain friends. He called me early the next morning, begging me to reconsider though and that we could work it out. The phone call woke me up this time and I simply told him goodbye. I went to work that afternoon and had a mental breakdown. I felt guilty for the breakup and felt like everything that happened was my fault. I wound up putting my two weeks in at my job. I wound up staying and I'm still employed there though, unbeknownst to him, and I texted Jack that I'd done so. He responded that he was happy for me and that is the last direct communication I have from him. Part four, the discovery. The summer was relatively refreshing for me. I began to work on improving myself, made some new friends and cut back my work to a healthy amount, all while getting back to my school course load. I didn't talk to Jack at all during the remainder of summer. In fact, I didn't even see him until late August after full classes resumed, when he passed by me with a new guy, let's call him New Boy. When I saw Jack walk by with New Boy, he pretended not to see me, but I couldn't hold back an ugly cackle. Jack clearly didn't want anything to do with me, but the cackle was from seeing Jack with someone new, because the manipulative statement he'd made when I dumped him became obvious. New Boy was not exactly a good looking guy either, which only added insult to injury. A few weeks later, I had a falling out with the elected president, let's call her Prez, of the design team. I was tasked to compile a part of a report that required others to do their part first. This report was due on a day that I had plans that could not be put off and no one did their part until the last minute. Thus, I was unable to do my part and another board member wound up doing it for me. I was transparent with my plans and I'd said why I couldn't complete it on my own and the board member apologized to me for stretching me thin like that. The president, however, was angered. She berated me and aggressively doubled down when I tried to justify why I couldn't do my parts. The exchange drove me to nearly rage quit the design team, but I held my head up and instead got to thinking about a path that took the high road. One thought led to another, and suddenly I was thinking about why my relationship with Jack failed. We're supposed to be in correspondence with one another, but he elected to not work with me, which was partly why I couldn't do my task. I simply didn't want to work with him either. At the same time as the falling out with Prez, the design group had a photo shoot for all elected board members to receive headshot photos. I, not being close with any of the leadership, was mostly minding my own business. Jack, however, brought New Boy along to try and show off in front of me. New Boy wasn't even in the design group. This quickly became evident when they began cuddling directly in front of me. This wound up being a bad call on Jack's part as it only made me consider further why our relationship had fallen apart. In these thoughts, I thought back to that fateful May morning and a terrifying realization came across me. The happenings of that morning were textbook SA. In hindsight, I'm shocked I didn't realize it sooner. 
I realized I was a victim and it was hard to come to terms with it. I initially diffused it with humor in a weird coping strategy involving denial, but I told some of my closest friends of the discovery so I didn't feel alone. I also pondered how I should handle it moving forward. I also had never returned the two things he left in my apartment, his key and a shirt that he really liked, one of his favorites. I threw the key away, he probably had his locks changed, and I wound up burning the shirt. Then the memory of what Jack said to me about his high school ex ran through my head, which I'd initially forgotten. I've been put in a mental trap that Jack was not capable of sexual misconduct, and this is probably why I'd mentally blocked the realization of me being SA'd for so long. Given what I experienced and based off what he said, I now cannot say that Jack did not R his high school ex, and this terrified me. I knew what I needed to do. I didn't believe that approaching Jack was the best move, but I felt that I was under heightened pressure since he started dating new boy and that he could potentially do it again. Part five, the reporting. Given that it took me over five months to discover the assaults, pressing charges was out of the question. I needed some form of administrative documentation if I couldn't press charges. And I wanted this by the book because I was disgusted that I was so severely wronged. Fortunately, my school has a program for Title IX that handles sexual misconduct. So I called them up and filed a report. In this report, I outlined in detail the happenings of that May morning and requested an informal resolution where my report was documented, but an amicable agreement was to be reached between Jack and I. There was a formal route that could result in academic repercussions as it went in front of a student honor court. But given my lack of hard evidence, there was an extremely high chance of the case simply being thrown out like it never happened. The informal resolution still logged the incident just in case anyone were to report him again down the line. The advisor that worked on my case had to be impartial, but he was on my side the entire time and reassured me that I was handling it correctly. In this resolution, I requested that Jack step down from his role in the design group, apologize to me, disclose the happenings to any current and future partners, consider going back to therapy, and be re-educated on the concept of consent. I asked for him to step down as the lack of communication between us and the team was starting to impact my work in the group further, but I knew that it would also be a difficult decision for him to make. This was intentional as I wanted the consequences of his actions to sting. The latter four requests were semi-filler but still had purpose, including covering my bases while staying by the book. The requested apology was so that I could feel some form of closure by him at least acknowledging he did wrong. The disclosure of the happenings was borderline intended to be a home wrecker for his new relationship but also this is a reasonable thing to disclose to your partner the therapy request was a low blow since he claimed he had to go before but a genuine ask and the consent education was a dire plea because if he can't recognize that being asleep isn't consent i'm not sure what he considers it to be part six the interim and the reports end In the midst of the report being filed and Title IX working on reaching out to Jack, the governing body at my school that manages student-run organizations deem me ineligible to be the design group's treasurer. Their system is really backwards and their reasoning was stupid. I didn't have enough credits to be considered eligible. They demanded a replacement treasurer. The president, who suddenly was nice because she needed something from me again, held a meeting and asked me if I'd be okay, still doing my job, but just marking someone else down as the treasurer to satisfy the governing body. I agreed. Now Jack was in this meeting and he quickly volunteered to put his name down with a smirk on his face. I, also smirking, simply said that was fine. The president then moved to crack a joke. She started to say how it's funny that Jack's taking your position since... She quickly stopped speaking, widened her eyes and looked at myself, then at Jack. Those few words told me that Jack had mentioned our relationship's end. The entire elected board was friends with each other, excluding me. And it also demonstrated to me that they were talking poorly about me behind my back. I firmly believe the comment she was about to make was her finding it funny that Jack was taking my position because we previously dated. But she stopped herself when she realized she was about to talk badly about me to my face. I smiled, feigned ignorance, and quietly dismissed myself from the meeting. Jack, on the other hand, was not staying in touch with Title IX. They reached him after about two months, and he initially admitted to the advisor that he did not disagree with the instances I described, but he wanted me to know that he was learning intimacy. I politely told the advisor that I could understand that to a point, as I was in the same boat as him, but that doesn't excuse his actions. I also asked the advisor if he decided on the resolution, to which he hadn't. 
The advisor then attempted to call Jack back to get a decision from him on whether he would follow my requests, but Jack began dodging phone calls for about two weeks. These two weeks were some of the hardest of my life. The ugliest parts of the relationship were playing through my head nonstop. I was drinking nearly nightly to ease my mind, not my proudest hour. I wrote a long emotional letter regarding my thoughts that was subsequently emailed to Title IX. I did this to document the feelings I had while further strengthening my case, which to people outside of myself was relying on anecdotal evidence. I called Title IX back, expressed my concerns once again, and they thanked me for the letter because it provided additional perspective from my side. I requested that when they reached Jack to give him this ultimatum, he needs to step down. I also asked they let him know that if he chose not to, that I would step down, but be thorough in explaining why I stepped down. I worded it intentionally because I'd begun to plan my exit with the design group and I was banking on Jack valuing his pride over accountability. I was right. After those two weeks, Jack finally picked up and told Title IX that everything that happened was consensual. I'm not stepping down and that's all I have to say. Title IX immediately called me with the news. I was simultaneously shocked, but not surprised. Even the Title IX advisor was floored that Jack had doubled back on his previous statements. I asked if the previous words or admission would hold up if I were to press charges, but because Title IX is protected speech, it wouldn't fly in court. I thanked the Title IX advisor for his help, knowing exactly what I needed to do. Jack had said the exact words needed for me to do my part all i have to say part seven the disclosure the aforementioned call came to me at 3 p.m on a friday shortly after i got home from classes less than 20 minutes later i was sitting in the office of the design group's faculty advisor we'll call them faculty advisor i told him what happened and what i was planning to do including my resignation jack's misconduct had not only wrecked my mental state but because i was outright afraid of being around him i was hardly participating in the design group outside of my administrative duties after I discovered I'd been assaulted by him. The faculty advisor was extremely sympathetic with what I was describing and directed me to hold a meeting with the elected board, including the president, to announce my departure. He gave me otherwise free will to figuratively set off a bomb. I organized a meeting with the entire board for the following Monday, sans Jack, and alerted them that the meeting was important, all while keeping the operation under wraps from Jack. Come the Monday meeting, I'd created a fun PowerPoint presentation that created a quick slideshow touching on all the topics mentioned above. The board arrived slightly tardy and were chattering amongst themselves until I launched the PowerPoints with the words wake up call displayed on the screen. I thought the title was clever. Oh, wow, I get it. I started by thanking them for showing on such a short notice. I announced my resignation, a background of our relationship, what Jack did to me and what I did, including making the Title IX report and what's involved by doing that. The board sat there in silence, absolutely stunned at what I was presenting them. I further went on to delegate my treasury duties, offering to assist anyone that needed it aside from Jack. I slightly mentioned that Jack was definitively the one responsible for my duties due to his quick volunteering before, and I looked at Prez directly when I said it. The look in her eye at that moment was sheer terror. That moment of his volunteering and her comment afterwards flashed through her mind. I paused for a moment to regain my composure. It was a hard presentation. I held back tears giving it. Then I continued on. I read the group's governing documentation and pasted portions from it in the presentation. I outlined their impeachment process and I recommended that they vote to remove Jack from his elected position. I tossed in the group's zero tolerance policy on sexual harassment in the presentation for good measure. I reiterated that Jack had violated me while I was unconscious and questioned how anyone could ever consider those acts consensual or humane. Everyone else in the room was crying by the end of the presentation, which somewhat surprised me at the time. Again, they were all friends with Jack, but were not close with me. They thanked me for telling them what happened and told me they needed time to process everything, but that they would keep me updated on what they chose to do. The board also asked me if I would reconsider staying if he stepped down or was otherwise removed, to which I told them no. My justification was that my impact in the group was too deeply impacted by his behavior and that staying around would only be keeping my wounds open. I left the meeting with a huge weight taken off my shoulders. Part eight, the last interaction with Jack. I walked back to my car after the meeting and texted a professional resignation message in the group's communication channel, citing personal reasons and wishing the best for the group. 
This would be the first of the communications that Jack would receive related to the meeting that had just happened. I directed any treasury concerns to Prez while they worked to appoint a replacement. These communications were kept professional as I intended to come out of the situation with grace. Any malice could have disrupted my efforts to be credible. I then drove over to the faculty advisor's office with the intent of catching him up on the meeting that happened. I instead pulled into the parking lot to see Jack's car parked outside. I thought to myself, oh great, he's probably inside. This might be fun. Coincidentally, Bestie was also stopping by the building and I ran into her in the parking lot. I hadn't seen her in a while, so we hugged and I told her that I just stepped down from my position and that I was doing pretty rough. My mind was still quite fogged from the meeting I just left. I told Bestie that I wanted to talk, but right then wasn't a good time and I invited her to talk later. She was entirely unaware of the happenings between Jack and I. She knew we broke up, but not why. As I turned to move inside, I saw Jack sitting inside his car and I realized exactly what had just happened. From his perspective, he thought he dodged the Title IX bullets. He just saw me hug Bestie, our mutual friend, and had likely been reading the resignation message I had sent. Furthermore, I was going into the building where the design group runs out of, which was, not proudly, a relatively rare sight. To top it all off, his phone was also likely blowing up from the elected board calling and messaging him to figure out what was going on. The faculty advisor wasn't in his office when I dropped by, so I messaged him an update of what happened. And I sat inside for a minute to collect myself after everything that had just gone on. I then walked past Jack's car to get back to mine, ignoring his presence, and I left. I couldn't imagine what Jack was feeling at that moment, though it was likely some combination of terror and shock. Selfishly, it made me feel good. Part 9. The Fallout The following day, the rest of the elected board reached out to me, mostly individually, to express their sympathy and check in with me. I'd kept what happened to about 8 pertinent individuals in order to not paint the entire group in a bad light. I still wasn't sure if the group was going to follow through with the request that I made to remove him, or if they even believed me. Well, it turns out they did. That evening, I received a notification from the elected board's group chat, as well as the group's general chat, with a message that tagged everyone from Jack, stating that he was resigning immediately upon facing immediate removal. He name-dropped me in that message and stated that I'd made false allegations that were investigated by the school and dropped. They weren't dropped. Title IX doesn't simply get dropped. He also claimed that he sought legal representation for the claims. None of what I did was illegal, so I call BS here. And he stated that he was disappointed by his friends. He spun it as them choosing false claims over their friendship. He then somehow sent this message as an email to every person who'd ever been a part of the group at my school. 700 plus people get this email with my name on it at 9.30 p.m. at night and my direct messages start going crazy. Why did I get this? What's happening? Are you okay? I don't know what's going on here, but he seems like he's hiding something. What was alleged? These are just some of the messages I got. I responded to most by simply stating that no one should have ever got on that email, but to not worry about me. But I was livid. The faculty advisor messaged me and he was livid. The entire elected board was livid and in shock, that he'd just sent that message. I messaged the faculty advisor to meet the following morning so he could catch me up on the internal fallout that I'd missed. Turns out, the elected board immediately reached out to Jack and said that he needed to resign or face immediate removal. Jack threw a tantrum and sent out that message, which he felt vindicated himself from any wrongdoing. The message made the board even more convinced that they made the right decision because they thought Jack was hiding something with the defensive tone he held in the email. In this meeting, the faculty advisor also confided in me that Jack was banned from the lab space because of that email, which was extremely unprofessional and painted the entire group in a bad light. He name dropped the group in the email as well. Because of the severity of the email and the now on record events that had occurred between Jack and I, the dean of my school was also informed. The faculty advisor reassured me that I had handled the situation properly and commended me for taking the high road. I'd not once spoken poorly about Jack to the elected board, nor did I drag the group through the mud, though I very much had the opportunity to do so. I made him aware of the conflict between Prez and I in this meeting. I also spoke to Bessie that day, who also received that email, and I told her everything that happened. She'd remained friends with Jack after our breakup, and she told me that he said I'd ghosted him. She'd not previously asked for my side. Remember those sappy text messages he sent before he asked if he should move on? Yeah, 
My not responding to all of those, I had responded to some, and I'd called him in between them as well, was what he'd framed as ghosting. So I cleared that air with her too. She was absolutely floored he could do such a thing, but we reconciled over many questionable behaviors that he displayed throughout my relationship and independently her friendship with him. And finally, part 10, the wrap up. With these events, I would say that I received my closure or at least as close to closure as one can get in this type of situation. I don't think that Jack believes he's done anything wrong, but honestly, I'm okay with that. I simply stated what happened and it caused a daisy chain of reactions that culminated in Jack losing almost every single one of his friends, as the heavy majority are in the group and were made aware of what happened, alongside his passion, which was the design group, and the space that he used to spend most of his free hours, in the group's lab. He also lost the faculty advisor's respect, who was a very prominent figure in our school, as well as Jack's now former boss. The school is keeping an eye on him now, while also potentially considering disciplinary action on him. When I say that the group was important to Jack, I mean it. When he wasn't in class, he was usually working in the group or spending time with the friends in it. I don't know what he's doing now. And honestly, I don't care. I don't see him around anymore. Now, remember new boy? Well, allegedly Jack was still together with him at the time I gave the PowerPoint. To keep my stance of being professional through my actions, I'm not gonna dig around to find out if that was the case. I don't know who the boyfriend is and Jack doesn't have a social media presence. Yeah, I could ask Bestie, but I believe that new boy received word of the incidences I brought forward. I suspect that Jack may be single as a result. Regarding the high school ex, I do not know who he is either, or if he even existed. This could have been a really screwed up lie that Jack made though. I made my decision to report Jack in the first place by going off the assumption that what Jack told me was the truth, that there were previous allegations made. I gave him the opportunity to take accountability for his actions, but he instead chose his pride and ruined his life in the process. As I initially stated in the beginning, Jack deserves so much worse for what he did to me, and most of the karma he received was due to his own pride-sparing actions. I would have sent him to jail if I could have, but the evidence I held would not be strong enough to put him there. He may not presently believe that he's done anything wrong, but those closest to him know that he did. And to me, the social repercussions he faced seem like almost suitable punishments. And there we go. That is the end of that one. Wow, what a story. An absolutely incredible tale. And I've got to say throughout all of this OP, it would have been so much easier in your spot to just throw your toys out the pram. I'd say honestly, validly, because what happened to you was a pretty terrible thing. Let's let's all be honest here and just go crazy and be malicious and try and get the worst possible punishment on Jack you possibly could and throw the entire organization under the bus. Just go crazy, you know, just do what, let's be honest, you would have been completely fair in doing and just saying, no, I need as much justice I can possibly get right now and not caring what kind of fire you left in doing so. But no, you had enough patience and grace and decorum to go about this in a much, well, I don't know, calmer way, right? I really don't think I would have been able to do this given what you went through, but fair play. Being able to say, you know what? I could go crazy here, but I'm gonna settle and do things the right way and just calm down and, and not ruin lives of people that don't deserve it, but just focus on Jack and ultimately let him cause his own demise because that's really what he did. I just want to mention one thing that you said at the end though, which I thought was interesting. You said that you made your decision to report Jack in the first place by going off the assumption that what he told you was the truth. That there were previous allegations made. Now, fair enough. The fact that there were previous allegations obviously makes this guy more concerning, but there don't have to be previous allegations for you to report somebody who has done that to you. Yeah, the fact of the matter is that if other people are saying this, then of course it is more likely that it's happened in the past, but the fact of the matter is it happened to you and therefore report it as much as you want. I had a male member of staff try to force himself onto another staff member, a female. She chose not to press charges, but that didn't sit right with me. To preface, I live in a country that employs a large foreign expat workforce in pretty much every industry and in all levels. For someone to move here for work, they have to be sponsored by a company or the individual that's employing them. I own and operate a small restaurant business here and employ more than a handful of foreigners as servers, cleaners, kitchen staff, drivers, etc. So here's the story. I was lounging on my couch enjoying the last of my weekend one day when I get a call telling me that one of our sponsored employees, a server, let's call her Janice, was picked up for indecent exposure essentially. Long story short, she was caught hooking up with a guy in a private booth at a local restaurant. 
Basically, the police walked in on them whilst engaging in some seriously heavy petting. They were fully clothed, but the guy she was with, or practically on top of, I should say, had his junk out. It turns out he works at the restaurant two doors down from where she worked. After a bit of chastising and threatening to escalate the situation and have them deported to sufficiently scare their senses back into them, they let them go but not before signing a pledge type document promising to never repeat the offense or else. A slap on the wrist basically and everyone got to go home, but it doesn't end there. That night, something clicked in my brain and I had the thoughts, how and why did the police find them in a private booth in the back of a restaurant before the restaurant's own staff did. So I called the restaurant the next day. I thought maybe they called the police on them immediately for some reason, or maybe the couple got belligerent when staff asked them to stop. It turns out the staff didn't actually notice a thing. In fact, up until that day, the police have never been to that restaurant before. And when they did, they simply walked in, went straight to the back booths where the two were sat, and they busted right in. I realized that this meant that someone must have seen them and called the cops on them point blank. The question was, who? I decided to speak to Janice. I wanted to speak to her anyway that day, both to check in and get her version of the situation. I also gave her the employer, you know you did something stupid chat, and I reassured her that she is keeping her job. I also wanted to ask who she thought called her in. Without hesitation, she said it had to be Sammy, who was one of our drivers. Why do you think it was Sammy? I asked. Well, he's the one that dropped me off at the restaurant that day. He might have seen my friend walk in right after me and called the police on us, she said. Well, that sounds a bit drastic. Why would he do that even if he'd seen you do anything? I asked. She claimed it was because he was jealous. He was really into her apparently and kept trying to get her into bed, she said. What genuinely annoyed me was when she told me that he actually tried to force himself on her once and she fought him off and that he hasn't tried or even said anything since other than being very short and curt with her. My immediate response was, why on earth would you not tell me or one of your managers right away? She said that she dealt with it her way and it stopped. Plus she didn't want anybody to get fired on her account and she didn't want any interaction with the authorities. So she decided not to make a big deal out of it in the first place. She also declined to press formal charges against him, which I advised her to do. Her declining infuriated me even more. This guy was going to get off scot-free. Now, clearly I was about to fire Sammy, but in my mind, that was not enough. For someone to attempt to R a person, basically, and not get in trouble for it, that's not okay with me. But it seemed like it was something that I'd have to live with. Obviously, my next conversation of the day was with Sammy. My intent was to confront him with the accusations. I called him into my office. I didn't really know where to start, so I went with... Obviously, you've heard about what happened to Janice this weekend. He stepped in it right away. Heard about it, came the unexpectedly proud response from a proud as anything and positively beaming Sammy. I called it in. And this is where it started to get super satisfying. You see, for a couple of years since I met Sammy, every now and then he would pull out and show us all pictures of his wife, who was back home living with his mother. She was younger than him and quite beautiful, but sadly barren, which is apparently why she settled with an older fart like him. He was so proud of how pretty she was. He was also a devout religious man, or so he claimed. So I ask, and why call the police? He came back with, After I dropped her off, I waited to see who she was meeting because she's a troublemaker woman. When I saw the man walking after her, I called the police because I knew him and he's married and this is against the laws of God and man. I'm smiling now. I know I've got him. Why do that instead of calling your direct manager or even me and before even seeing for yourself what they were doing exactly at that? Why make it my problem and the company's problem what she does in her own time? Silence head down counting his shoes sammy i know why i know what you did janice just told me i'm disgusted by you and sorry that we hired you he had the audacity to mumble i only tried once sir i almost slapped him anyways i fired him handed him a one-way ticket home which was in four hours and told him to gtfo this is where i get my not so petty revenge I had his house phone number safe somewhere from when we hired him. It was on his CV. I knew that because I called him there to interview him before we first hired him. I waited until his flight took off and I dialed the number. I assumed either his mother or wife would answer the call, but I was wishing for the latter and I got my wish. Hello, Mrs. Sammy. I'm your husband's employer. Well, his former employer anyway. 
Just so you know, I fired him a few hours ago and he's on a flight home as we speak. His flight number is this. He'll be arriving at this time. And just so you are aware, I was forced to fire him because he attempted to R a fellow employee half his age. I'm sorry. I said that and promptly hung up, but not before hearing her gasping in shock. Well, there you go. A phenomenal piece of revenge to start off today's episode. And I completely agree with you. Look, obviously it's not your decision if this woman presses charges or not, but you can still be really upset that she didn't and want to take things into your own hands. And if you're the wife here, are you not kind of relieved a little bit to know what's going on? Obviously she's in a state of shock at first, but after a period of settling down, I think she's going to be happy that Opie has told her what Opie has told her. By the way, I only tried once, sir is absolutely crazy like think about that what even is that for a sentence former manager made my life hell and i finally got her fired i was desperate to join a new job after my husband and i were both laid off last year when i was offered a new role i knew it would be a step down from what i was doing but the manager and the team seemed great and that part hasn't changed However, since my manager Gary was so busy, he basically offloaded me to another manager, Jane. I was supposed to be the connection point between my team and Jane, but it quickly became Jane micromanaging me. She would ask me to work through lunch, move or cancel vacation days, call me at 11 p.m. on weekends and order me around on phone calls. She would also make nasty comments about my weight and said that I was big for my race. The list of personal slights is so long that it filled three pages. I would talk back to her and she did not like that and that provoked her more. I only stayed because we needed to pay the bills. Finally, I had a mental breakdown on a Friday afternoon after she yelled at me for something trivial about scheduling a meeting without including someone from her team who I didn't know about. I was dealing with a family tragedy and I couldn't take it anymore. I told Gary about the situation with Jane and he was sympathetic and not at all surprised considering half her team quit. He immediately offered to move me to a different team under him and I was thrilled. Well, it turns out that going to the new team didn't help. Jane continued to order me around from afar. When I ignored her emails, she came to my desk one day and started loudly talking about how I'm not qualified for this role. Now Gary overheard and finally told her off, but the verbal abuse did not stop. After two months there, I abruptly wrote my resignation letter and I also stapled the list of Jane's offensive comments to it, CCing everyone. Gary offered a bunch of accommodation to try and keep me, but seeing how she was still provoking from afar, I said the only way for me to stay would be for her to go and he just didn't have that authority. Her manager was in a different country and despite several HR complaints from at least five people, nothing was done. So I left loudly and without shame, telling everyone exactly why I was leaving. Times were very bad for three months. There were nights that we would eat slices of bread just so we could pay the mortgage and emergency expenses from a health crisis and a funeral. Even after my husband found a job, we were still catching up on bills and we still are. I spent months applying to five to 10 roles per day, sometimes over 20. Last month, I saw a public memo about a big shot from a former company joining the company I just left. Now, I used to work with this guy closely, so I texted him. Congrats, let me know if you need any insights on the new place. We had a quick call where I told him some ins and outs, where I thought they could innovate. And after this call, he asked me to join the team as his chief of staff. I accepted. Imagine Jane's shock when we had our first all-hands call. All the VPs and above were asked to welcome the new Big Shot in a giant conference room. In Big Shot's speech, he breezed over that I'll be his chief of staff, along with a few key names. I now sat two levels above Jane, and apparently, within the three months that I wasn't there, the other half of her team turned over. Every single person left. Gary was excited for me and said all nice things. However, Jane took the classes route and sent Big Shot an email about how I'm an unqualified idiot, that I used to work for her, how I tried to get her fired, and that she suspects that I lied to get ahead. She didn't even try to be fake nice. Big Shot forwarded me her email and asked what this was about. I was so nervous and excited. Little did Jane know I was a director at the Big Shot's competitor company under him and was already a level above her. So two levels now isn't a big leap. 
and I worked with him for five years. I had an hour call with Big Shot and told him she was bad for the company culture and was a nasty person in general. But the evidence he needed was Gary confirming that her whole team has turned over. My prior resignation letter, which was still sitting on my desktop when I logged in upon return, and a few other nasty emails she sent her recent staff, which they were happy to share with us. Big Shot fired Jane on Friday. Another great piece of revenge here. The only thing that slightly annoys me is that everyone knows that Jane is a terrible person, right? There's a reason why half her team has left and why I presume more and more employees were talking about leaving in the office, you know, people that worked under her. Why does it seem so hard to get people like this fired? You know, I don't have the authority. Oh, she's not done enough. I don't really care. Like if someone's a terrible person and nobody enjoys working with them, then they shouldn't be at the company. To me, it seems as if this could have all been so easily avoided by everyone just saying, okay, look, let's be honest, guys. No one actually likes this woman and she's actually not very good at her job. Simple as that. Couldn't you just do that? I don't know. Maybe I'm missing something here, but nonetheless, a good outcome. I just feel like it could have been done so much sooner. And in that case, if it had been done sooner, loads of people would not have lost their jobs. Yeah, fair enough. You may have not ended up getting that amazing job that you have now, but in general, you know what I'm trying to say. A lot of people had to lose their jobs for Jane to finally be fired. And I'm not quite sure that's right. Try to steal my legally rented parking spot. Enjoy being unemployed. This happened last night, but I'm now in a good enough spot to actually post this. I'm not quite sure if it qualifies as pro, but it definitely isn't petty. I am a professional driver, and as such, on the roads in the US, there are different truck stops throughout the country that has a pay to park system. Usually about 10 to 20% of the lot marked off as reserved, with each space running from $15 to $25. The truck stop where this took place had parking for $17, which is relatively cheap for a guaranteed spot. The spots are reserved for 24 hours, starting at 4 p.m. local time and extending to 3 p.m. the following afternoon. I knew that I would have a late night delivery, so I came to the truck stop at around 3.30 and paid for a reserve spot. I told the manager on duty that I had a delivery up the road that night and would be back once delivery was completed, but should still be able to clear out the spot by the next afternoon, which is today. She told me this was fine and she would mark the spot as sold when I left. That way, if someone else comes in trying to reserve that spot, she could consult her notes and deny the sale. Quarter past 11 rolls around. I take off for my delivery. I don't get out of that facility though until 2.30 a.m. the next morning this morning. So I groggily drive back to the truck stop to reclaim my paid for spot, only to find that the reserved parking spaces are all full. I call the manager on duty and after giving her my info, I inform her that all the spots are full and that someone has parked in a spot and hasn't paid for it. She sends her other employee out to start checking trucks. The culprit was from a company that is known for their bright orange trailers, and he was a company driver. The other employee starts banging on his door to inform him that he is parked illegally and that he has to move. Meanwhile, I can see the commotion from my mirror, with my vantage point in the fuel island where I've been instructed to temporarily park. The driver answers the door with a bottle of Heineken in one hand and some sort of smoking implement in another. I know what it is, but for the sake of the mods, I'm not gonna say it. I decided to roll down the window to hear the commotion and I hear the employee tell the driver to either move or he will get the towing company and police involved. This driver is flat out irate that someone had the audacity to tell him where he can and cannot park, so he slams the door on the employee, threatening him. The employee calls the police and tow company, and the police show up first. I'd worked for this company before, so I know their policies, and more importantly, what they can and cannot have in their trucks. Alcoholic beverages are not allowed in the cab. Anything that isn't a cigarette or a cigar and a lighter, also not allowed. The coup de gras, a pew pew of any kind, absolutely not allowed, and especially not allowed loaded. This driver had all of that and some other not so legal substances in his cab, so he was hauled away in cuffs. His truck was hauled away on a wrecker. I made a call after the commotion died down to the company's safety director and informed them that their rig will be in an impound lot and their driver is going to jail over the not so legal stuff he had in his truck. She thanked me and said that he will definitely lose his job, especially over the alcohol and the other not so legal stuff. I guess he played the screw around and find out card and it bit him in his career. Well, that was just a calamity from start to finish. This guy is asking to be arrested. You can't be doing all this in the first place and then have a loaded gun in your car, be drinking alcohol, have some other illicit substances. I mean, come on, you're asking for it at that point. 
What is going on? It was just a matter of time, surely. This guy was on a, a path to prison. Simple as that. But hey, I guess he did save $17, so every cloud. Um, I'm sure he can use that in prison to buy probably nothing. I, I don't really know how prison systems work. Uh, yeah, my tip to this geezer would be only do one crime at a time. Because doing this many at once, yes, it's too much. It's just too much. Town forced to bulldoze new development after building on land they don't own. Hi, Reddit. I've got one gem of a story that my grandfather told me about his hometown after he came home from World War II. It has to do with a tree farmer, a corrupt mayor, and over 20 homes getting bulldozed. Enjoy. At the end of World War II, thousands of troops were heading home, starting new families, and wanted to move out of the city. There was a major housing boom all around the country. People couldn't move out of the cities fast enough, and developers could not build homes fast enough. There was a ton of money to be made in the construction business, which led to some underhand building practices. One such practice was starting construction before the land acquisition was finalized. Enter my grandfather. After serving as a pilot during the war, he came home to a very different town. When my grandfather went off to fight in 1942, the town that he described leaving was tired and worn down. But to his amazement, the town he saw stepping off the train in 1948 was anything but. Newly paved roads, a traffic light, and new homes. New homes that just went on and on. He actually got lost on his way back to the family farm due to the new main town road being rerouted while he was away. But what took him by surprise the most was the new development being built on his childhood friend John's tree farm. This was surprising to him, mainly because he knew how much the farm meant to John and his family. The farm went back at least two generations, but my granddad just guessed that the developer made John's family an offer too good to refuse. However, that thought was shot down later that evening during his welcome home dinner back home. It was my great grandmother that tipped him off that something was off. He couldn't recall exactly what she said, but it was something along the lines of, oh, I just wish John was still alive to be here. My granddad nearly choked, not because of the news, but because John was not dead. He was still in Hawaii. My granddad had gotten a postcard from him not but four days before. It turns out that while John was off in the Navy fighting in the Pacific Theater, John's dad had suffered a stroke and passed away. And his mother passed away less than a week later from a broken heart. More than likely, John was never informed of their passing. And now, 20 plus homes were being built on their land. My granddad about ran out of the house, jumped in his father's Model T, and raced down into town to send one bombshell of a telegraph to John in Hawaii. John, your folks passed. Farm now being built on their land. Come quick, granddad. My granddad never got a response back. He figures that John must have fainted from shock, then jumped up and ran to the Navy base to get on the first boat home because he was back home in less than four days and he was mad. According to my grandpa, when he burst through the doors of the mayor's office, everyone in the room looked like they were about to drop dead. The poor desk clerk was fumbling over his words, trying to talk to John. Then the mayor came out of his office to see what all the commotion was about. As soon as he saw John, he went white as a sheet, then ran back into his office and locked the door. Getting nowhere at the mayor's office, John went to the next town over and hired a lawyer. What followed was a seven year court case that ended in the mayor being sentenced to eight years in jail and the developer going bankrupt. It turns out that after John's parents passed away, John wasn't able to be contacted for some reason and was just assumed dead. So when an out of state developer wants to build homes in the area, the mayor just permitted them to start building on John's farm for a hefty kickback, of course. Also because of John's lawsuit, the developer couldn't finish the pre-sold homes which ended up in more lawsuits. In the end, the mayor and the developer and the town ended up having to pay John close to $45,000 in total. That's over $752,000 today. And then the farm had to be returned to its prior condition. To say John was happy would be a vast understatement. Today, John's tree farm is a nature reserve and the story of the corrupted mayor is all but forgotten, except for by a few locals. John passed away in 1999 and my granddad has been back to his hometown a few times to visit his grave and to check on the old tree farm. And there we go. How about that for a story to kick off today's episode? That was nothing short of sensational. I absolutely love that one. Of course, it completely serves this corrupt mayor right. I do feel like it's a little bit harsh on the property development company. The mayor of the town has literally told them they can do this and now they're the ones that are having to pay the price for it as well as the mayor himself. It's a little bit tough on them. However, 
for John and his family, this is just quite cool, isn't it? Like, you get your farm restored. Obviously, it's lost some of that originality, of course. But then you also get, in today's money, three quarters of a million dollars. I mean, I know which one I'd rather. Can you imagine being John in this situation, by the way? You know, just chilling in Hawaii, cocktail in hand, and he gets this note through. Yeah, by the way, everyone thinks you're dead. Uh, and also, your parents are dead. Uh, it's a pretty crazy message to receive. You also have no home anymore. Yeah, I'd probably get back as quickly as I could as well. Now for our next story of nuclear revenge. Fire me for speaking up. Enjoy going out of business. Many years ago, I worked at an automotive repair shop that was owned by a very nasty person. This person actually had two shops that he ran, and the best way I can describe him was as a tyrant. Both shops had cameras, and he would watch us work from the comfort of his home. If he saw something he didn't like, such as taking a five-minute smoke break, or not sweeping for half a minute during downtime, or if he just wanted to bust balls, he would call the shop and harass us. Or, better yet, at times, show up and harass us in person. In addition, he would regularly berate us for no reason threatened to not pay us because the shops weren't busy and would have an absolute meltdown if you dared question his authority. It was spectacular in the worst of ways. After working for him for a few months and dealing with his shenanigans and getting sick of pointless arguments with him, I started reconsidering my employment there. Around the same time, the owner decided to move me from one shop to the other, really for no reason other than to likely try and push me out as that was what he did with the few people that I'd already worked with. Odd coincidence being that I hadn't discussed my thoughts of leaving with anyone, but I digress. I genuinely disliked the idea of working at this other shop. It was older and a bit run down, plus it was in a pretty terrible area with high crime. But I wanted to line something up elsewhere before I jumped ship. So I made the move. This is where the beginning of the end started for old Mr. Owner. Once I got settled into the new shop, I got to talking with my fellow technicians. As it turns out, the owner was unsurprisingly a racist scumbag, and every single one of the employees at this location, aside from me, was African American. I'll spare the details, but let's just say it's a miracle that the owner came into the shop, said what he said, and walked out breathing. In addition, he would regularly send people home with no pay for the day, just to be a jerk. Wow. This went on for weeks. Him coming by, being nasty to all of us, and I was just over it and was just about to leave as I'd lined up other employments. The other techs were also over it. I went to give the owner my two-week notice via phone, discreetly, which I should have known wasn't a great idea, and instead of discussing it like a human, he decided to come down and talk face-to-face. Well, our friend was so incensed that I put my notice in that he forced me to clock out and go home, and also forced two other techs who decided to stand up for me to do the same. I decided that I'd had enough of this guy's trash, and that not only did he deserve to have some kind of reciprocation against him, but the other techs deserve better than to continually be walked on. So, I filed a complaint with the Department of Labor and outlined everything. Within a few days, they'd launched an investigation. And of course, the owner found out who filed the complaint and called the shop and gave me heck about it. Stupidly though, because the phones he had were on recorded lines. Guess who I had request to listen to that conversation? In the end, I was terminated by him prior to my two weeks being up, as were the two techs who stood behind me. I filed for unemployment, which he fought me on by filing appeals with a judge, then not showing up three times in a row. This prompted the judge to bar him from requesting appeals against me and granting me full unemployment pay. Months later, I got a written letter from him extending an apology and an offer to work for him again. Two months later, I got a letter from the DOL saying that the investigation was closed and that he'd been found guilty of multiple charges and was barred from operating a shop or any other business in the state for several years. Wow, I must say, I did not see that curveball coming at the end. Just when he knew he was about to be in massive, massive legal trouble, he was like, you know what? I'm going to try one more time. Actually, do you want to come back and work for me? We had a great employee-employer relationship. I think we could amend this and get back to what we once were. I, that's, yeah, fair play for trying, mate. Fair play for trying, but uh, see you in the cells. And now for our final revenge story of this episode. Girl who played me ends up getting played by the dude she cheated on me with. I am a 26-year-old man, and my ex, a 24-year-old female, let's call her Maggie, had been dating for about six months. The first five months were great. 
We started off slow, seeing each other once or twice a week for the first month. I realized I really liked this girl after our fourth date. She came back to my place that night and magic happened. After that, we started talking every day and I basically had zero desire to talk to any other woman. I deleted my dating apps. I cut contact with this other girl that I'd seen a couple of times right before I met Maggie. And I felt good that me and Maggie had a good thing going. Now, I include these details as it's important to an incident that happens down the road. For the next five months, we went out every weekend, spending almost every entire weekend together. So, one night, after a night out having food and seeing a comedy show, she's just in an awful mood. There are about six comedians performing one after the other. The first two came up and had that whole, female dogs ain't trash, blah blah blah, don't ever settle act. It got laughs, but not from me. After a set, immediately, my girlfriend leaned over and asked what that was all about. I just shrugged and said, he thinks negatively of women. It's a comedy show, so take it with a grain of salt. She just said, I know. But then the whole of the rest of the show, she couldn't find anything funny. Fast forward to the second to last guy who had a funny story about his cheating ex, but no hatred in his voice. He seemed over it and did not badmouth her at all, especially compared to the first guy. Maggie wanted to leave after this, and I didn't object because I could tell she was not enjoying herself. The car ride home was absolute projecting at its finest. For 15 minutes, I was hit with accusations of finding misogyny to be okay, and that I'm probably cheating on her because all men do it. While I was driving, I literally unlocked my phone and told her to look through my texts, but that wasn't enough. I dropped her off and she said we're finished and that she'd never seen this side of me before. I sat there shocked and at a loss for words. She got out and didn't turn back, just walked into her house. I'm not gonna lie, I cried on the drive home once I was out of her presence. It was that helpless feeling of thinking you did everything right, but realizing it's not gonna work. A month passes by and I sort of am over it. I'd reached out once, being ignored, and then the feelings dissipated gradually with no contact between us. Hindsight really is a female dog. Why didn't I see through the BS sooner? Fast forward to a Friday night where I'm just hanging with a couple of buddies. I get a call from an unknown number. I ignore it. Five minutes later, a text. Hey man, I think you and I should talk. You know Maggie. Well, I saw her text between you two and I think you're going to enjoy this. I could feel this grin coming across my face as I realized what was happening. I knew before he told me. I called him and he basically told me that she was playing both of us. Except this dude had a far worse end of the stick. I come to find out they've been married for two years and he was home in Brazil taking care of his dying mother for the last six months. Oh my god. Wow. I didn't expect that. He reassured me he was not mad at me and that he knew I was a good guy. I just felt bad for the guy at this point. Honestly, however bad OP must have been feeling at that stage, think about this other bloke caring for his dying mother in Brazil and then you hear about this? Oh my word, your wife of all people. Goodness me. Here's the best part. He then explains to me that this past weekend, they drove in his registered car about six hours out of town for a concert and weekend getaway. At the concert, her phone died and he went to use the bathroom in inverted commas. But actually, he slipped away, drove back home in his car, and packed all her trash up out of their house. He then drove another 90 minutes to her parents' house, explaining the whole situation, and dropped all her stuff there. He blocked her number after she demanded he pay for her flight home. Let's just say her parents aren't too proud of their daughter's decisions, and have reached out to her husband numerous times, begging for his forgiveness. What a guy to reach out to me and share his delicious shenanigans. We're still friends. Wow. And there we go. What a way to end today's episode. That was a truly sensational story. That line about her being married for two years and her husband caring for his dying mother in Brazil for six months may just be one of the most shocking twists of a story I've ever heard. I just did not expect that. I thought the guy was going to call him and say, just so you know, you're being cheated on like with me. Just let you know. Not, oh, I'm actually her husband and I know what she's doing. (laughs) There you go. And that is the beauty of life. I guess, depending on which way you look at it. Don't kill your neighbor's dogs. My crazy antisocial elderly aunt lives in the mountains of West Virginia. My aunt is a mean, bitter old woman who was suspected of shooting and killing her ex-husband, but the cops could never pin it on her. Years ago, she bought a small home on some land that borders the land of another family in a small, narrow, isolated, forested mountain valley. 
The other family had been living there for a long time and they just wanted to be left alone Like most people who chose to live in a remote mountain location in west virginia My aunt bought chickens and started to let them run around Unfenced on her property and the neighbor's dogs were very interested in those chickens The chickens would roam around and go over onto the neighbor's property one day without warning She killed her neighbor's dogs for killing one of her chickens and only one of the dogs was killed on her property The other one was shot dead in the neighbor's front yard The neighbors had small kids and they loved those dogs My aunt walked over with a shotgun and told the neighbors that they had better never get another chicken killing dog or dogs Again or else she would kill them too The neighbors didn't take too kindly to her killing their dogs and her actions with the shotgun Waving it around and threatening them were over the top But they didn't call the cops knowing that my crazy aunt who had a reputation for being violent was unlikely to be arrested And if she was arrested, she would just quickly be released from jail and be back So a couple of weeks later when my aunt went into town her home's back window was broken and a bottle of burning oil and gas was thrown into her home. By the time the fire department finally arrived, the home was a complete loss. And every dog and possibly ex-husband killing shotgun and firearm my aunt owned, along with all her other worldly possessions, were incinerated. The home was a total loss, along with the chicken coop, etc. The neighbors didn't see anything, and the sheriff's department couldn't prove anything. My aunt had a long list of enemies. She didn't work and so was too poor and lazy to have her homeowner insurance. So she had to move and her son eventually bought her a cheap rundown trailer in town. Those of us who knew my aunt figured she got what she deserved. Moral of the story, don't screw with a mountain man's dog. There we go, emphatic but very justified revenge there. Brilliant stuff. If you've got a problem in your life and you know a way that you can deal with it and get that problem gone forever, then do it. And it seems like you did. I'll be completely honest. I'm kind of surprised that you didn't go any further and cause actual harm onto her yourself. As I've said multiple times, I've never owned dogs or proper pets. I don't want to be harsh on my own pets, but you guys know what I mean. So I I can't speak on the bond that you have with your pet. But from what I've heard and from what you guys are going to tell me in the comments down below, if your dog was to be shot by your neighbor for no reason at all, I mean, come on, killing a chicken, yeah, they're dogs. What do you expect? Then I think a lot of you out there listening and watching right now would have done a lot worse things than simply burning down your neighbor's house. My ex fiance refused to respect my boundaries, so I married his best friend. Back in 2019, I just moved my long term partner into my house due to a series of poor life choices on his end. It had been a rocky relationship for most of its duration, but I was young and dumb. I believe that this was him wanted to commit and truly start our lives. By early 2020, we were engaged. I was a full-time university student, sole caretaker for my mentally disabled mother and taking care of the house and our pets. He worked a standard 40 hour week, minimum wage job and refused to help with any aspect of life. I found out on Christmas day, 2020 that he'd been unfaithful and had forgotten to tell me he was planning on leaving me but had informed everyone except for me because he was failing to secure a new residence apparently his f buddy didn't like him enough to let him move in at this point there was very little love lost and i expected he'd be moving out within the coming weeks fast forward three entire months and his search for a living place was non-existent and he was acting more and more entitled Clearly by this point, he's an unwelcome freeloader who's taken up residence in my living room. I was about to secure an eviction notice to get him off my couch. He began swiping Tinder with his phone volume loudly on. I told him to not do that in my presence as it was highly insensitive to do it in my home and could he do it in private? But this continued. So I told him that I was gonna sleep with one of his friends. It was said in a moment of anger and was more of an empty threat at the time. However, I am known for seeing goals to their completion. I messaged the guy who was supposedly my ex's best friend and the best man for the wedding. It turns out he didn't even consider my ex a close friend and my ex had acted similarly terribly to this guy previously as well. We bonded over our terrible experience, hit it off really well in general, and started dating. I was upfront about what the catalyst for me to reach out to him in the first place was. And after two years of dating though, we were married April 2nd. 
He watched me graduate with that bachelor's degree my ex disliked. I'm halfway through my master's and my husband works in a specialized steady field that supports us. Last I heard, my ex got kicked out of his dad's house, never was able to officially date his side chick and has not made any choices to better his life. You know, the great thing about this story is that even after everything that happened in it, right at the very end, the side chick didn't even consider this guy to be worth more than sex. Plain and simple. And uh, that is the true tragedy of this story. What was it all for? Again, you know, people say everything happens for a reason. And I'm, I'm a little bit cynical just in general. So I, I, would, I would tend to disagree with that. But when you read a story like this, I, I can't help but think, you know what? This was meant to happen. It really was. It's just a perfect story, a perfect ending. You got out of a relationship, which probably wasn't ideal anyway, if you think about it properly in hindsight. And now you're in a great one with a, with a guy that really cares about you. It's a win-win. And now for our third story of this episode. Now, let me tell you guys, this one is class. It's a long one, so settle in, but it's brilliant from start to finish. Here we go. Former manager ends my job at the company I loved. I helped end his career in local tech forever. First of all, the background. I worked at a very big tech company for a very long time, like decades. Over the years, I'd worked my way up from being a noob to a kind of specialist fixer. I became fairly well known internally as a security slash emergency response person. I got assigned the bad or unfixable projects, many of which made news headlines. I have many stories that I can never tell publicly, sadly. Suffice to say that multiple senior vice presidents in various divisions got to know who I was because I effectively wrangled gnarly and complex problems and herded many intense tech nerds together to resolve big things in multiple divisions over the years. It was so fun. At the time of our story, I was working on a small security team in a product engineering division. It was a somewhat turbulent time and our team of eight had weathered multiple reorganizations and had so many manager changes. It was a lot, but we kept our heads down and did the work and we all got along just fine. Sidebar and relevant for later, one of the better managers assigned to run our team immediately assigned me a huge and complicated and urgently important project to manage. It would involve people in six different divisions, had seriously big legal implications, and our senior VP wanted it to happen by an aggressive deadline within like four to six weeks. Oh, and my manager was leaving imminently on a long planned vacation. So he apologetically would be away for the next three weeks and would be unable to assist. The project was to do something big and technical and which had never been done before. So no one was entirely sure how to do it, who it would require, what steps in what order, some of the key players had what we gently called difficult personalities. Oh, and by the way, it would definitely make international news and cause a ripple in the industry when we did it. No big whoop. The manager was a decent guy and he felt bad about leaving me with this thorny mess. And I did it. We got all the people from all the divisions in a room and mapped it all out on a whiteboard. It took days. We hashed out how to do it before the deadline, actually well before for bonus points, and we lined up everyone to get it done. Before we pulled the actual trigger on the very big thing, I had to attend a meeting with the VP and exec leadership, several levels of management above me, and with the legal team to present the plan and to assure all of the execs that we were ready and had it all handled. So I looked the VP in the eye and I assured him that I've got this. And then I did. The team did the big thing sooner than the deadline. It was flawless. We rocked it. Woo, just another day at the office. Part two, the inept manager. A few months after that epic project, our good manager left us for another role. And someone new moved over from an unrelated division out of nowhere. We'll call him inept manager. Inept manager did not know anything about security. He did not know anything about emergency response. He didn't know anything about what our division did, in fact. No one on our team had ever heard of this guy. He was that worst kind of middle manager. Self-important, dismissive of everyone, cares most about appearances and ego, micromanages stuff he doesn't comprehend, and just makes everything worse. But he apparently knows people, and those people get him job assignments because of politics, loyalty. Well, he certainly didn't have any skills or experience for our team, Ugh, that guy is the worst. One of the Annette manager's many weird quirks was that he didn't think it was appropriate for our team to disagree with or correct each other in front of other people. Things in tech, specifically product development, move pretty quickly and things can change all the time. 
So if some of our team was meeting with someone from another team and someone said something like, so we decided to make the sky green and we're on schedule and someone else on our team chimed in to say, actually that's changed. We decided that the sky is now going to be blue and we pushed the deadline back two weeks. That just happened in an earlier meeting. Oh, okay, cool. The inept manager would interrupt that and say, we clearly need to get on the same page. Let's end this meeting right now and reschedule when my team has all the facts straight. Um, what? That's insane. We'd literally never have any meetings if we waited until everyone knew all of the same information all the time. Other teams would routinely leave meetings with us with inaccurate info, which affected release schedules, resources. It was just a mess. My question is, is that not the point of a meeting to get everyone on the same page? Hey, maybe I'm wrong and Annette Manager knows something I don't. Part three, Annette Manager hostility. Shortly after the Annette Manager became our manager, he started being really hostile to me. Not to everyone on the team, just me. As far as I knew, I hadn't done or said anything to earn his hostility. But suddenly, after over 20 years at this company, I could do nothing right. While this jerk didn't actually understand most of what my job was, he was sure I wasn't doing it right. And he was quick to tell me so, and often in front of others. To the point that my co-workers would take me aside to ask what the actual frick was going on. I didn't know either. The thing is, I was the only woman on the team, and I have a disability. Now, I've been through some things working in high tech over those decades. It was very much an old boys club back then. And meh, I was fine. I'm not one to claim discrimination at the drop of a hat or for no reason. However, when I was trying to piece together the cause of this dude's hostility, some of his comments were sexist and not at all subtle. He also didn't like that due to my disability, and frankly my seniority, I was given one of the few offices with a door on it in our new building. The rest of the team was in open floor plan cubicles, which everyone hated. He was incensed that I, a lowly direct report, and woman, got an office. And he didn't. Well, I had more seniority than just about anyone, so even without my disability, I'd have scored the office ahead of him. Note that other men in our division got offices too, because again, seniority, but that bothered him less. I was the only woman on our floor with a door, and I was his subordinate. His ego did not like it, not one bit. He threw a fit about it repeatedly. There were lots of other things said. My favorite among them towards the end was him reprimanding me for my bad attitude in a meeting we just had. The Annette manager had told me beforehand not to say anything during that meeting because he was insisting on sharing incorrect information again and he knew that I'd want to correct it. So I sat quietly and I kept my eyes on the PowerPoint presentation or the floor nearly the whole time. When I asked him how I'd had a bad attitude when I hadn't said anything as he'd requested, he said, I didn't like the look on your face. Um, okay, dude. After realizing there was nothing I could do to make this guy happy with my work and to lose his hostility, I finally went to HR to go on the record. I knew they'd do F all about it, but I wanted to document it at least. So predictably, they told me to work harder at getting along with the inept manager. And because it wasn't my first rodeo, I went back to my office and emailed HR saying, thanks for meeting with me about my concerns about inept manager. I fear his bias and misogyny will reflect negatively in my next performance review. HR should be aware that there is a real problem here and I hope you'll take steps, etc, etc. Which of course, they didn't, but now it was on the record. Part 4. The Axe Falls And then, a few months later, he gave me a terrible performance review, as expected. Long story already long, he was trying to fire me for underperformance. Unfortunately for me, the company had started rounds of layoffs all over, and it was the worst possible time to be looking for another job internally. And now, I had a bad performance review on my record too. I went back to HR and said, That thing that I said I was worried would happen when we met six months ago? Yeah, that happened. Exactly as I said. Now what? HR, once again, was no help. Also, they'd done literally nothing, but hey, it was on the record again, helpful for the attorney later. Blah, blah, blah. When I realized I couldn't find a new gig at my company because of all the layoffs, I scored a new job for much more money at a different local tech company, and pretty quickly. I live in a tech heavy area. There was lots of shuffling between three to four big companies during this time period, and we'd often bump into other company veterans at these other companies. It was a small world. With my track record and references, it was super easy. 
After that was lined up, I called an employment discrimination attorney to negotiate my exit from the company I thought I'd work at until I retired. Sad face. Because I had documentation with HR explaining the inept manager's misogyny and ableism going back for some time, and because they'd done nothing about it, and because there were witnesses who confirmed his behavior, they had no leg to stand on. They agreed to write me a relatively nice check to go away and to not sue them. And I agreed to not talk about the details of my separation agreement. I went down to my lawyer's office and signed the agreement. I looked to see who had signed the agreement for the company. I assumed someone from HR, but it was still blank. I'd eventually get a copy once someone there signed it. I took my check and packed up my office and left. By old company, I started my new job a few weeks later. Part 5. Now we're getting into the revenge. Karma begins. This was August of that year that I left. I got my copy of the executed contract in the mail in October. Who signed it for the company? Not HR, but my exec VP. The one who asked for the urgent, highly important, legally complicated project. The guy I looked in the eye personally and then delivered on this very big thing that he personally asked for before the deadline he asked for. That is who signed on my separation agreement. I suspect that he had no idea until that moment that I was gone. And I imagine that he likely had many questions about what the frick had happened. And also, why did they have to pay me a chunk of money on the way out? Whoops. I chortled when I saw it. Since the VP knew me and we had some history, and the inept manager was new to the division and was one of hundreds of middle managers he'd likely never heard of, I'm guessing the inept manager had some explaining to do. Mwahaha. I really enjoyed the thought of that. And finally, part six. Karma for reals. Cut to November. As I mentioned, it was a relatively small tech community in the area. And those of us who worked in security, in particular at Company X, would often encounter other current and former colleagues at Company Y or Z or whatever. Heck, there was a ton of poaching going on between the companies. One day, I got an in-company chat from someone who'd worked in security at my old company. We'll call her Security Colleague. Security Colleague asked me if I knew someone named Inept Manager. Um, why yes. Yes, I did. Why? Because Inept Manager was appearing on Security Colleague's schedule to interview for an open management position the very next day. It seems that shortly after my former exec VP had signed my separation agreement contract, Inept Manager was actively looking for a new job at a new company. Heh. Security colleague asked me what I thought about him. I said, you know, I can't really talk about it for legal reasons, which boom, everyone knows what that means. But if you wanted to ring my personal cell phone later this evening to catch up on old times, please do. She did. I hypothetically shared some stories with her about the inept manager. I also told her where his hot buttons are, the appearance, ego thing, the dominant stuff, etc, etc, and all about his misogyny and ableism, which was perfect since she was conducting his interview. I may have shared some specific scenarios and questions to ask which I knew would set him off. I wished her luck and for the love of all that is holy to please call me after when appropriate and tell me how it all went. Obviously, it did not go well for the Annette manager. When security colleague rang me, I couldn't wait. How did it go? Well, he got combative and angry and yelled at me twice during his interview to be hired as a manager. Facepalm. There were lots more details, now lost the time. Except at that company, interviewees were assessed as such. Either you were given strong hire for this role or hire, but not for this role. That means not a good fit for this job, but we like them. Thirdly, no hire. And then fourthly, no hire ever, not for any role. The Annette manager's interview was rated that last one. No hire ever. Blacklisted from any job ever at one of the biggest tech companies in the world. After being pushed out the door of one of the other biggest tech companies in the world. Derp. Shortly after that, it appeared that a net manager moved himself and his wife and kids a few states away to work at a smaller company in another region. It took less than six months from when I left my old company for him to be gone as well. What gets me, still, is that the net manager thought I was so inconsequential, so unimportant, that he didn't bother to check and see where I landed after he forced me out of the company I loved. And when he had to look for a job himself shortly thereafter, it also never occurred to him that I'd have connections with, oh, thousands of colleagues that I'd worked with over the years, some of whom, of course, could now be working at company X, Y, or Z, 
where he was interviewing and where I'd scored a huge raise for myself. To this day, he doesn't know why his interview at Company Y tanked so badly. And since security colleague was not legally precluded from sharing stories that she'd heard through the grapevine about Inet Manager's management problems, it's possible that other old security colleagues at Company Z and other companies in this area heard those stories too, which means that he's unlikely to get a job at any major tech company in this area maybe ever definitely not at x or y and they are big companies among the biggest and it's all because he's a jerk ableist misogynist middle manager who underestimated little old me Mwa ha ha ha. and there we go a great story to end off today's episode it it's really sucks to be fair that you're in that position you know a company that you've worked at for over 20 years you said one that you saw yourself retiring in and all that that dream just ruined by this annoying guy who, you know, had a crazy ego and thought he was better than he actually was, of course. It's very sad because not often in life do you get a job that you love and that you actively want to stay in until retirement. I mean, that's an absolute joy. It's a privilege, right? We could all dream of something like that. So for that to be ripped away, yeah, this guy deserved that revenge. Fair play to you, OP. Well done. I was able to simultaneously gain a 30k per year pension for my mother while wiping my POS father's retirement. My father is the Canadian Satan. Growing up with him was less than fun and I can assure you, based on witnessing it, he was a less than fun husband. I'd go on about what a POS my father is, but instead I'll quote a judge. You're the most despicable human I've ever had in my courtroom. And that's coming from a family court judge. I read this whining endorsement of my dad's personality in the court documents I acquired related to his divorce with my mum. The same place I discovered the crazy stuff that he'd engaged in to steal from my mum. It's also where I found the information I needed to get one over on him so severely that he's going to disinherit me. A frame of reference about my father is that he's a pathological narcissist and behaves exactly how those people are compelled to act. They aren't generous people and punching them in the wallet is like a slap shot to the taint from Gretzky. He's kind of like Donkey from Shrek, but also Joseph Stalin, a monstrous jackass. Chapter 1, Hosea 3.8 Those that sow the wind shall reap a whirlwind. Our actions always have consequences, and my father has plenty to answer for. My attempts to hold him to account didn't jump to immediate jihad. They started with diplomacy and a therapist. About 10 months ago, when our tale begins, I was going through some stuff. Stuff being a whole lot of PTSD related to both my dad's abuse and my job as a paramedic. He did a ton that affected me deeply. Things that I needed to move past, along with all that other razzmatazz from 15 years of EMS. In so trying to move past and work through everything, I quit drinking, started turning my untreated PTSD into treated PTSD, and thinking having my dad involved might help me and our relationship. Well, I seriously freaking misjudged that one, so you'll probably be unsurprised to hear that conversation went swimmingly. I'll spare you the lurid detail, but when I broached the subject with him, our back and forth degenerated into visceral hate, with him screaming at me that I'm a failed paramedic liar and pos alcoholic while i have a certain pride about my job i have more pride in my 14 month sobriety so hearing this from my old man might have caused me to behave a little bit psychotically i got right annoyed at him and decided to dig up every bit of dirt i could see what kind of man he actually is and has been when it was convenient i hopped in the mystery machine before taking a trip to the courthouse to unleash my inner gumshoe everything is public record so i bulk bought copies before retiring to my easy chair to read plot and pet my white long-haired cats for good measure i obtained a file of divorce document from my mother soon enough i hit upon a line of inquiry worth following up on it seems that during the final settlement of my parents' divorce, this was in 2002, my mother was awarded one third of my father's employment pension. She was a stay-at-home mother and could not earn one herself, so it was given to her by a judge. Mighty freaking strange, because my father, as he brags, took a nearly full pension and retired a bit early. There's no way that guy was living the last 10 years after retiring early on a two-thirds pension. He isn't constantly complaining about it. So I asked my mother if she was collecting a pension from his job or had cashed out the value, 100K plus at the time, 20 years ago. The answer was no to both questions. Well, that's interesting. I wonder if that's collectible on and what 20 years of compound interest from a pension fund makes it worth. 
Well, I did eventually find out, along with the fact that my dear old dad had been collecting my mother's portion for 10 years in hilariously open violation of a legal order from a judge. Why didn't my mother pursue this sooner? A combination of being unable to afford a lawyer, being his victim for 20 years, and pessimism after so much of his continued dodging obligation to the order. She just quit. There is effectively no statue of limitations that he could hide behind because of the wording of the document. Insofar as I could tell, I had him dead to rights and my mother would be collecting. It would be a slam dunk. I just needed to hire a lawyer to help me. So I set out to find the most unbalanced, bloodthirsty, psychotic who passed the bar exam. Chapter two, and your pension lady? As it says in the good book, screw unto others as they would screw unto you. So that's what I set out to do. The misanthropic sociopath I hired for legal counsel suggested we send a demand letter to the pension office to try and remedy it before filling what would undoubtedly be an easy win for him. I agreed in spirits and instead phoned up the pension office and got put through to the woman managing my father's file. Well, she was a delight and it was a trivial matter for me to get her to loathe my dad. We talked for 45 minutes and I swear if you'd given me another hour, I could have convinced her to suicide bomb his house. In all our conversations about life, families and relationships, we got down to some things of note. Since I could show her correspondence her office had sent to my father, CC'd my mum on, from some years ago and ongoing for five consecutive years, trying to resolve this matter, which he'd ignored, she was more than willing to start the process on remedy immediately. Full cooperation from this lady and her office was a matter of merely providing documentation and with my lawyer on retainer, this office was beyond asking my father to comply. They complied for him. About two months since I last spoke to my father and he had no idea his pension was about to take a serious hit. Below, I'm going to break down how big a turd I put into his bowl of ice cream. My mother's portion was made whole and adjusted to reflect that her portion was brought to maturity and beyond. So his early retirement doesn't affect her fund. So he loses 10 years of valuation to her. He also retired three years early, which knocks him down now to 17 years of pension valuation, not 27. If you've forgotten, my dad had been collecting my mum's money and was overpaid by 30k per year for the last 10 years. Like I said, mum was made whole. So the pension company is going to claw back that overpayment from the base valuation of his current pension fund i'm not exactly sure what that does to the number but it effectively nerfs my old man's private retirement fund he does though have government old age pension but he took that early too whoops my dad did some awful stuff to me but i only had to suffer 17 years of him My mum still has the high score at 20. As much as I did this for spite and malicious glee, I did do it also to give my mum a chance at a proper retirement. Chapter three, glitter bombs of justice. My mother started collecting her pension about three months after I contacted the pension office. And to celebrate, she bought tickets to New Zealand for the family for Christmas so that we can see our relatives. I was able to get most of my retainer from the lawyer back. And to celebrate, I went online to order a glitter bomb. I was able to ship it to my old man anonymously from another country. God bless the USA. I heard through my sister that he opened it up in his stupid red Miata. Oh God, he'll never get rid of it. Okay, as I was reading that story, I'm not going to lie. I was trying to do the maths as I was going and um, I couldn't do it because I'm stupid. But goodness me, that's a lot of money. Let's just try it quickly. Come on, give me the benefit of the doubt here. 30k per year for 10 years that's about 300,000 right that's the first lump sum and then on top of that i can't be able to work it out but all the compound interest that you're talking about the stuff that the pension fund must have made the fact that your dad's had money taken out of his government pension fund as well and all the stuff that he's had to pay back it's not looking good is all i will say i hope that your mum has a much better retirement and old age life than your dad um because it's what she deserves you know it's super unnecessary as well but i actually love the glitter bomb at the end Like, you've made so much money out of this man. Rightfully so, I will say. Like, it's your mum's money. But still, you've got so much money back. But no, just to be petty, right at the bitter end. Pedo gets entire life ruined. I've gotten permission from my older sister to write this story. I'm not the one doing the revenge here. Rather, my father, uncles, and a few gang members. My parents came to the United States in 1987, coming from Zacatecas, Mexico. A few of my aunts and uncles were living here in South Central LA before my parents came. I have in total five siblings, two sisters, and three brothers. I am the youngest, now 18 years old. My sister is three years older than me, so 21. She was 13 years old at the time of this story. My uncles were gang affiliated, and my eldest uncle, who is now 62, was an amazing tattoo artist. This is relevant. My dad wasn't a gang member, but was well known in our city for participating in gang activity, but he never really jumped in. One of my uncles threw a party for his daughter's birthday. 
Practically anyone who wanted into the party was allowed to join. I know, stupid mistake by them. Myself, my brothers and mother weren't at my party as it was also my mother's sister's birthday and we enjoyed being around her more. But my sisters went with my dad as they were close to my uncle's daughter. My sister was left alone sleeping in my cousin's room since our parties always ended up going until the next morning. The door to my cousin's room didn't have a lock. As my sister was sleeping, she felt someone touching her. As she woke up, she realized it was a boyfriend of one of our older cousins, 17. The boyfriend was 19 at the time. Nothing was known beyond that until a month later when my sister finally told my mum. That's so brave of her since she was only 13. Many people at that age keep quiet for years. By then, everyone on my dad's part of the family became aware of this, including my older cousin, the one with the pedo boyfriend. She was heartbroken but agreed on something with her dad. She set up her boyfriend into meeting up with her at a local park. My dad, along with my uncles and a few members, waited at the park at around 9 p.m., Very lonely, barely lit, a quiet park. A friend of my uncle, known as Santi, rest in peace, had a small RV in which they waited. That POS arrived at the park. That is when my dad and the rest ran up to him and started beating the heck out of him until they dragged him into the RV. Once inside, they still continued to beat the heck out of him until they arrived at my uncle's place the one who did tattoos. Once they arrived, they took him inside where my uncle was ready with all of his equipment and gave him some new artwork all over his face, neck, head, and hands. All over, he had writing indicating that he was a pedo, including an extremely big tattoo across his forehead all the way to the right side of his head. They waited until he woke back up at around 2 a.m. They dumped him in front of his father's house, not to be discovered by neighbors until the sun came out. My father left a heavy, well-written note on the door of the POS dad's house. This led to his dad giving him his own set of beatings and finally kicking him out. Surprisingly, one of his friends let him stay with him for a while until a month after the incident, him and two of his friends were found guilty of a murder charge. Apparently, the murder happened around three months before this whole incident. The pedo was charged with a second degree murder along with a few other charges. He was sent up to Chino Penitentiary. Two months in the pen, he was R-worded, beat, and finally killed by some African Americans getting shanked three times in his chest by a screwdriver. We're not sure if this happened due to his tattoos indicating he was a child pred or if it was mostly a race thing. Regardless, if any of this didn't happen, he would have still been taken to the pen due to his conviction. So my uncles and father have no guilt for this. My older cousin understandably mourned his death for a while as it was so unexpected expected for him to turn out to be such a pos to this world they were together for three years prior to this incident as for my sister she is doing well for herself currently attending cal state long beach well that is good news at least the fact that your sister is now in a better place i mean the fact that she said this in the first place at just 13 years old as you said op the vast majority of people in this situation probably to be expected don't say anything they're so scared to even mention it to anybody and they live with it for a long long time maybe forever before ever saying anything but the fact that she said that after just a month is incredibly brave i mean unbelievable as for this dude the child pred What do we reckon, guys? Get in the comments. Is it fair that he had the tattoos put on him, that he went to prison and was killed, murdered? Is that justice? Some would say it is. Some would say it's a bit too far. Let me know. What do you think? For me, I'm not going to lie. I think it's just about all right. They screwed me out of my pay. I screwed them out of their company. Many years ago, I got a job with a marketing company during phone deregulation. It was the Wild West, and a lot of small long-distance companies sprang up, all trying to get a piece of the pie. Eventually, they all got bought up by the bigger fish. But at the time, they were all paying hired gun marketing firms very well to score contracts for them to lock people in. I got a job with one of those marketing firms, a new age capitalism company that insisted we all do yoga and breathing exercises while they rang a little bell and gave us affirmations about how many contracts we were all going to sell and how much money we'd all make. The job was 100% commission, but I was always good at sales, so I looked at the pay scale and noticed that it was exponential, presumably to entice people to work hard with impossible payouts. We were allowed to work as many or as few hours as we wanted, with the payout based on your weekly sales numbers. I decided I'd give it a shot for one week to see how much I could realistically make before deciding whether I was willing to put up with the tasteless vegan snacks and mandatory voluntary yoga regime. For the next week, I pushed myself as hard as I could. For seven straight days, I worked 14 plus hour days every single day and used every trick and technique I'd learned doing sales to score as many contracts as I possibly could. I figured that this would tell me my maximum possible income and could decide on that basis whether to stay. At the end of the week, I'd blown everyone else out of the water. In fact, I'd not just gotten more contracts than anyone there had ever seen in a week, I'd gotten more than any of them had seen in a month. 
because of the exponential scale, I realized that I was making absolutely ridiculous amounts of money, over $10,000 per week. They had never expected anyone to actually hit those kind of numbers. Coming in the next week, expecting a huge payday, I ended up with about 5% of what I expected. They told me there were problems with a lot of my contracts and that I would be allowed to fix them and submit them a few at a time over the next several weeks. These problems were things like an apostrophe wasn't quite clear or the dash in someone's phone number was slightly crooked. They were going to screw me. That night, I got a phone call from the company's office manager, Frank, who wanted to meet up for a drink. Curious, I agreed. Over beers, Frank told me that the owners of the company were in a panic because I would have bankrupted them. He said they spread out all my contracts on the floor of the office, then they crawled over them, inspecting each one, trying to figure out if I was committing some kind of fraud. When they comprehended that all my contracts were legit, they decided they had no choice but to screw me over. Frank told me he realized at that point that if they would screw me, they'd screw him too. And besides, he was tired of doing yoga. He asked me if I would be interested in going into business with him and going head to head with his bosses. I thought it sounded intriguing, but I asked him how he thought we could compete. Frank explained that he'd found out they didn't actually have the contract for our city. They were acting as independent contractors for another company who had the contract to market the service in an entirely different city. They were poaching here because the person who did have the contract here wasn't actively using it. We put together a pitch and approached the guy with the real contract, Joe, and told him about the people poaching his turf. We agreed that we'd split with him. We'd take the upfront money for each contract and he'd get the back end money down the road. It was a good deal for everyone, so Joe contacted the phone company and had them threaten the poachers with a big lawsuit if they didn't stop a week later frank and i strolled into the offices of our old employer most of the furniture and all the yoga mats were gone and there was just a table a couple of filing cabinets and a file box with the final pay envelopes for everyone i made a show of counting my money to make sure it was all there and the two owners husband and wife told frank and i bitterly that they'd have to take cash advances on their credit cards for this money and asked me if i felt guilty for destroying their lives i smiled and said nope and left Our marketing company made us a lot of money over the year until the company got bought up by Sprint and the gravy train ended. Well, my friend, if you were bought out by Sprint, it it seems quite unlikely that the gravy train ended. That's ridiculous. I mean, to do that in a year, very, very impressive. Fair play to you. You know what's funny is that people that do illegal things like these two owners who genuinely have frauded you out of what? 95% of the money that you rightfully made that you were contractually obliged to Then say, when you do something legal to get revenge on them, do you feel guilty? No, obviously not. You were the one that broke the law. I stuck by the law and ruined you. Your fault. Revenge and roadkill, a love story. When I was a sophomore in high school, a new guy moved to town, Matt. Matt played guitar and I was a singer. Our love was meant to be. We started dating when I was a junior and he was a senior. I was 16, he was 17. Honestly, it was a super cute romance that would probably make a decent Wattpad story, but it wasn't meant to last as I was moving to a new state at the start of my senior year. This story takes place about two weeks before the end of my junior year and the school and town are getting ready for senior graduation. Matt was my first everything. Losing my virginity wasn't great, but is it ever? For everyone's sake, I hope that I'm wrong. Matt and I were awkward, but managed to talk boundaries before anything happened. In this conversation, we agreed that it was really important to both of us that this stayed private. Absolutely no bragging or being weird around friends. Griffin was a senior and someone who was in our group of friends, but not a close friend. We were all in either orchestra, choir, and or band. Everyone in those programs ran in the same social circle. Griffin was a Christian and it was a big part of his identity while we were at school. He had this like charisma or something. He used to invite classmates to his church while gently shaming all of us for not being exactly like him. Even though he was a bummer, his whatever charisma kept him active in the social scene and he was at all of the major hangouts I can remember during that time. I was friendly with Griffin because to put it simply, I lacked confidence. I grew up in a church where I was taught that men were more important than me. To never question a man, my own mother shamed me for wearing my volleyball uniform at home because it was inappropriate and could confuse my brother. Screwed up doesn't begin to cover that church or the amount I had to unlearn. By the time I was 17, I was fully done with church, but still struggled with all I'd been taught. It was a confusing time. Griffin knew this and his self-assigned senior project was getting me back to church. I'm 99% sure it was only about getting Matt involved because Griffin also wanted Matt to be a Christian but had so far been massively unsuccessful. Matt was not a Christian and had zero desire to know more. He saw firsthand how the church treated me and my family after some rubbish happened that was out of our control. Matt was not a fan. I kept a journal during that time in my life because if I didn't, I'm sure I would have done something terrible to myself. 
My journal was plain, nothing on it to draw attention because I never wanted my family to think it was a journal. It was supposed to look like a school notebook. One day during lunch, I was at my usual table where Griffin sat. I realized I needed something from the choir room, so I left my stuff at the lunch table, not thinking anything about leaving my backpack there. I had no idea anyone would go through my stuff because that had never happened before, and I didn't have anything of value in there anyway. Well, as it turns out, my journal ends up being valuable because I'd written about Matt and I. Griffin thought he had the ammunition to get me back into church, and I'm assuming Matt was supposed to join us. Griffin proceeded to take my journal and tell basically everyone in our social group, which led to most of the school knowing. A private moment became everyone's, and it was freaking humiliating. Thankfully, Matt didn't blame me, even though I felt like it was all my fault. He was more confident than I was, but also didn't get nearly the same shame thrown his way that I was getting. I knew I was leaving in a few months, so I tried to keep my head down and focus on school but being called a multitude of slurs by people i grew up with it grates on you after a while i guess griffin's plan was to shame me back to church but instead all i wanted before leaving town was to ruin griffin it took some time but i got there matt our other friend henry and i were hanging out at my house after school my house backed up to a street that often had roadkill due to being right alongside a huge swathe of woods at this point i knew that my revenge was going to include griffin's brand new truck this truck was literally all he could talk about because it was custom his parents got it for him as an early graduation present it was super expensive it was perfect the bottom line is he loved that truck more than anything he'd ever had i'm not a car person so i have no idea what the truck was or if it was good but i do know it was really really tall like you couldn't see the top of it which ended up being bad for griffin but fantastic for revenge there was a big super dead possum on the road behind my house that had been there for what seemed like a week but i don't remember how many days exactly Normally, the town was good about sending the guy down our road to pick up roadkill, so it had been there long enough for me to notice it, which didn't happen often. I was staring at the possum because, well, it was there. I'm staring, Matt starts staring, then Henry starts staring. We start talking about Griffin while we're all staring at this disgusting pile. We're talking and I'm getting mad, madder, then livid. However, I calm down when I realize we have an amazing opportunity in front of us. Gentlemen, we're going to bag that super dead possum and put it in Griffin's truck. This wouldn't be quite that simple, so we start brainstorming how we can fully get away with this. Griffin lived in the area of town where it was faster for him to walk to school instead of drive. Shortcut through the woods to school meant a three minute walk. Driving to school meant that he had to go 20 miles an hour or slower, and one of the cops was always out because of how the schools were placed, so no speeding. It still took barely any time, but it was a longer route than the short shortcuts griffin of course drove to school we had a plan i snuck out that night met matt and henry wearing all black and a mask bagged up the super dead possum the most disgusting thing i've ever done and drove to griffin's we parked a bit away and went through the woods to the back of griffin's house lugging this bag of putrid nonsense this was before the time where a lot of people had cameras on their property so we didn't have to worry about anything besides floodlights on the side of the house we decided to put the possum on top of the truck knowing that griffin wouldn't be able to see it couldn't drive like a butthole and wouldn't be taking his truck anywhere besides school so that possum was freaking bloated and if any of you are at all familiar with bloated roadkill you may know where this is going the possum was heavy and not going anywhere until this revenge was done the next day at school griffin parks in the student lot like normal we go to class like normal i get called a few names throughout the day and everyone is normal i went through that day gleefully awaiting the final bell knowing griffin was in for a nasty surprise this is happening two weeks before graduation and a very southern state it was hot as anything where i grew up with 90 percent humidity on top of it so the bloated super dead possum on top of griffin's car that possum did what an old bloated possum is gonna do which is explode if you've never experienced this smell i hope you never do the final bell rang Matt Henry and I strategically placed ourselves a bit behind Griffin so we could see him once he got to his truck. When you made it to the parking lot, you made it to the smell. It was so horrible. People were gagging, frantically looking around, trying to find the source while covering their noses and sprinting to their cars. I knew this plan was going to satisfy my revenge, but I never imagined this level of chaos. Griffin gets to his car, and because the possum exploded, he definitely notices it now. Also, he had his windows cracked open, and all the juice seeped into the roof, down the windows, and the inside siding of the doors. There was no way he was driving home, so he had to call a tow. Griffin started vomiting because he'd stood too close to his truck for too long matt henry and i were in the music programs and often stayed late so we stuck around for this whole fiasco nobody noticing us and we get to see everything griffin manages to get on the phone calling his parents crying that his truck had been destroyed and we could hear his dad yelling from the speaker eventually the tow arrives the guy gagging but he gets the truck loaded up and out of the parking lot 
At this point, Griffin had been yelling, crying, and vomiting about his truck long enough that the people left at school knew what had happened. And by the following morning, everyone knew. When Griffin came into school the next day, his parents and a guy in a suit were with him. A lot of people knew Matt and I had issues with Griffin. Matt was called to the principal's office, but never me. I never know the exact reason for this, but it's most likely a combination of not having any physical evidence against Matt and myself, and that no one imagined a woman would be involved in a retaliation scheme so disgusting. Griffin, his parents, and Guy and Sue tried to throw weight around to get some type of punishment for what happened, but there wasn't really anything the school could do to appease them without knowing who did it or having evidence that it happened at school there were cameras at school but it was clear that griffin arrived at the school with the super dead possum already on his car everyone totally knew that griffin's car was destroyed by matt and probably me but never henry there's no reason to suspect henry but with no proof no one could actually say anything after that day people stopped calling me names and i was mostly ignored until i moved away if people did have to talk to me they were polite and to the point I was told years later that people were genuinely terrified of Matt and I because plenty of trash had been said, so everyone thought they were going to be next. The super dead possum was very effective. Pretty sure Griffin's truck ended up entirely unusable, but I don't know what they did with it. I only know that they spent a lot of time and a decent amount of money trying to get the smell out with no luck. Wouldn't be surprised if every car detailing service within 100 miles was used. Griffin didn't speak to Matt or me for the remainder of my time in that town. He stopped sitting with us, stopped going to events that we were at, and never invited us the church again i was only around through the middle of summer but it was long enough to witness a noticeable difference in griffin's behavior the graduation ceremony arrived and being a year younger i was in the crowd cheering for my friends this was completely unplanned but i get giddy picturing his face decades later i managed to make eye contact with griffin after he was done walking across the stage and quickly made an explosion motion with my hands and winked He knew exactly what I meant. The only true drop the mic and I'm out I've ever had. And there we go. I think that has to be one of the most original nuclear revenge stories I've ever read. Imagine Griffin's reaction coming out of school and being like, okay, first of all, what is that truly repugnant smell? Second of all, why is it getting stronger as I'm going towards my car? And third of all, oh my God, I'm now vomiting. I would have loved to see it. Now that you could argue that maybe it's not nuclear. I mean, we've seen definitely more serious revenge tales than this one. But you have to remember that these guys were in school. There's a limit to what you can do here. And getting a dead animal from the road and completely writing on someone's car with it, that's pretty nuclear to me at that age. Also, you've got to think about the amount of money lost during this. I mean, the car alone is very expensive. And I imagine they also tried to spend a lot of money, as OP said, through all these dealerships, trying to fix the issue, but to no avail, it seems. That's a lot of cash. Now, before we get into our next story, I have a very special announcement for you. After an insane amount of demand from you guys i'm delighted to say that i've released some limited edition not today karen merch picture this you're out and about in the streets and a wild karen appears and starts confronting you what do you do well normally you have to talk to a witch like this however get one of these t-shirts or hoodies on and all you have to do is simply point to it laugh and walk away how easy is that the link is down in the description if you like what you see go ahead check the stuff out i think they'd make a great christmas present or even just a little gift for yourself as always it's official stuff from the very best supplier so the quality is unmatched and it's one of the best ways to support me and the channel with that being said let's carry on how i got a car dealership to give my friend a newer car Circa 2020 January, my friend makes a stupid decision and buys a brand new car he can't afford. His insurance is like $400 a month. He makes like $10.25 an hour working as a shift supervisor at McDonald's. His car payment is like $7.95 a month. Now at $10.25 an hour, 30 hours a week, that's a weekly income of about $300 a week or about $1,230 a month. So yeah. So my friend came to me for help because I used to sell cars and I know the industry pretty well. I go over his paperwork. The dealer did rip him off, but my friend is trying to find a way to get out of this mess. And ripping someone off isn't illegal. They did, of course, overcharge him for warranty. They gave him a higher APR. They had add-ons, etc. But none of that is illegal. And I know the only way I can get my friend out of this deal is if they did something illegal. So I look at his finance application that my friend signed. It correctly listed his income, which turned a light bulb on in my head. No bank is going to approve someone for a $795 car payment if they're only making $1,200 a month it does not make mathematical sense to do that so i start searching through his paperwork for the finance app the dealer submitted to the bank 
Oftentimes, when you submit a finance application at a dealership, the dealership will take the hand-filled out application and reproduce it electronically. This is pretty normal. However, on the application the dealer submitted to the bank, the dealer said my friend was a GM for the McDonald's and made $70,000. My friend had good credit, so it doesn't appear like the bank asked for proof of income. So I go to the dealership with my friend and tell the sales manager he's going to want to put me in touch with the GM because we're going to be unwinding my friend's deal and giving his trade in back. The sales manager thought I was joking. The GM also thought I was joking. Then I demonstrated how his dealership finance department committed bank fraud. I showed the GM the finance app my friend filled out. I then showed the GM the finance app his dealership submitted to the bank and pointed out the income difference. My friend really made 14,000 a year. The dealership claimed my friend made 70 a year. That's bank fraud. That's a felony. Let's keep this simple, shall we? The GM sees his dealership is in a load of trouble. The proof I'm presented to him is rock solid. He knows it. I know it. We're all on the same page. He goes, okay, so what can I do to make this right? I go, unwind the deal, give me my friend his trade-in back. Unwinding the deal is basically the GM agreeing to cancel it and basically erasing the deal and pretending it never happened. The GM tries to avoid that, but I remain firm and remind him that we can easily take this documentation and turn his life into a living hell. And he knows I'm right. My friend also needs a car to get to work the next day. The GM says he'll check into it and he comes back and tells me, unfortunately, they sold his trade in already. I said, that's fine. Unwind the deal and let's put my friend into something as good or slightly better than what he traded in for. The GM goes, so he'll buy a car similar to his trade in? I said, no, you'll give him a car similar to his trade in. The GM goes, it doesn't work that way. I go, it does when you commit bank fraud. He's upset with me and I remind him I'm actually being really nice and the situation can totally get really ugly. Like felony level charges ugly, like losing your franchise ugly. So yeah, this is going to hurt, but it's going to hurt less my way. The GM goes, all right. And he looks in his inventory and he tells me they have a 2007 Focus with 10K more miles. I tell him, no, the car you give my friend needs to be the same or better than what he traded in. The GM counters. I'm giving him a free car. And I go, no, you took his trade in, you sold it, you made money on that sale. You also committed a felony in the process of selling him his new car. You're now correcting that mistake. This is not a free car for my friend. This is you correcting your mistake. The GM insists that's what he's willing to do. I tell him, if he can't do better than that, we will go to a consumer protection attorney and have a conversation with them. Now, my friend didn't want to go down this route, but that was our plan B. We get to go up and the GM says, wait, give me one second. I have an 08 Civic. It has 5K more miles, but it's a Civic and not a Focus. I'll unwind the deal of the new car and put your friend in the Civic at no extra cost. We agree. The GM has the paper drawn up. The old loan on the new car is cancelled. They take in the new car again, but because it's already titled, they'll have to sell it as used. That sucks with them. And they gave my friend a better car than the one he traded in. Now, for people asking why we didn't get a lawyer involved from the start, we could have done that, but courts take a long time. And this was a faster way to fix the situation. Uh, Quite a lot to unpack here in this one. First of all, I have to say off the rip, you need to educate your friends somehow on financing, like get him into some sort of finance class. Because yes, you helped him out in the end, But I mean, that decision on its own in principle was absolutely ridiculous. Paying that much for a car when you're only earning pretty much the same as that when you add the insurance together. Yeah, that's nuts. Uh, Please make sure he gets a little bit more responsible with his money. First off. Secondly, I really like your rationale for not going through the legal process because I completely agree that might well have been way more effort, time, money, who knows, than it actually you know needed to be. In the end, you got a good deal. Like, yeah, you probably would have made more money had you sued and gone through the legal route. But who really wants that at the end of the day? Like, ultimately, your mate has to go to work the next day and he has to be able to drive. Logistically and even emotionally, it just made a lot more sense to do what you did. So good thinking there. However, what I will say is that despite you doing all of this, I think I would still at least report it. You don't have to sue, but report it to the authorities. Because as you say, this was illegal. This was a crime. And let's be honest, it's almost definitely not the first time this has happened. And if you don't report it, it's likely to happen again. So not just for your friend's sake and your sake, but for any other customer in the future and in the past sake, I think you should still report this. Haribo Revenge goes way further than intended. I was a witness to this a long time ago, and the results were learned off by word of mouth. Once upon a time, there was a kid. Let's call him Marco. Marco was your everyday kid, a little skinny. I remember him being slightly geeky. If you left your pens unattended, he'd disassemble them before you turned back around in your seat at times. He was nice, polite, and fairly helpful. This was middle school. One day, though, he does it to a bully. Let's call him Polo. Polo is huge, but with fat. He looks like if you drilled three holes into him, a giant could use him for bowling. 
He's not nice. He's not handsome. He's got a posse of equally disgusting friends who all gang up together to bully others. I suspect that if they hadn't ganged up with each other, they would have been bullied. Perhaps they had been in the past and got a taste of power over others when they ganged up. I don't know. I kept to myself. One day, I see Marco with a swollen eye and wet hair. He's limping a bit too, and his backpack is ripped. I asked him, what the hell happened? It turns out, Polo threw him into a bathroom stool by his backpack, which ripped. The toilet got him in the knee, and Polo shoved his face into the water, bashing his eye into the seat. I asked why Polo had done this to him, and he says, I took his pen apart. It was just a bit crystal or some cheap pen like that. Things escalate over the next few weeks. Eventually, Marco has to take time off when Polo strips him naked in the bathroom except for his boxers and makes him shove them into the toilet. The school, being full of your typical buttholes, tries to expel Marco for damage to school property and does nothing to Polo. This is stopped by video evidence of the gang leaving the bathroom, laughing and rifling through Marco's backpack, then tossing it in the trash. When Marco comes back, he's different. He's not happy. He's quiet, subdued. He doesn't talk to anyone and bruises magically appear on him between classes. He withdraws into himself and begins to look positively skeletal. Of course, no one at the school does anything except this one nice jock. He comes across Polo stealing Marco's backpack and folds Polo into a trash can. Of course, he's suspended, but does it again when he comes back. The teachers give up on suspending the jock after his parents threaten to sue. The fact that someone bothered to stand up for him, though, seems to have given life back to Marco. He starts opening back up and putting weight back on, which is very good. One day, though, he's wearing a scarf, a very special, beautifully knitted scarf. His grandfather had knit it for him. Yes, grandfather, before he died. Polo steals it and comes back the next day with a bag of ashes, handing it to Marco. He laughs hysterically. Marco comes back the next day with a backpack full of sugar-free Haribo gummy bears. Polo, being the glutton that he is, steals every single bag of bears and eats them by the fistful throughout the day. Marco cries, but I remember something in his sobs that didn't quite reach his eyes. Near the end of the school day, Polo lurches out of the classroom and bolts for the bathroom. He doesn't come back the next day or the next. Someone says they saw blood in the bathroom. Polo comes back a few days later with an eye patch and mottled fading bruises all across his face. I believe it's called petachii. He is permanently blind in his left eye and the bruising makes him look like a ripening fruit for as long as it lasts. He's in and out of school for doctor's appointments for a while. He didn't mess with Marco again and instead became very introverted and quiet. The reports of blood in the toilet of the bathroom he went to were never confirmed, but it's quite likely. Wow, a very nuclear start to this episode. This bully, let's be honest, deservedly going blind in one eye. Nobody likes a bully, so is this fair? I don't know. Maybe it is. Now, OP explains later in the comments that Polo was actually extremely intolerant of sugar substitutes. So that is the reason why he had this reaction, ending up with burst blood vessels in that eye, leading him to go blind. Unbelievable. You know what? Fair play to Marco. I can't think of anything worse than getting bullied by someone like Polo. And also, fair play to the jock for stepping in, taking the suspension on the chin, but doing it for the right cause. Both of you, absolute legends. Cheating ex, flaunts side chick, loses his job, and she gets graduation dress burned into oblivion. This happened almost 10 years ago. So even if dots get connected, I know I'm safe as per our laws. This didn't actually happen to me, but I executed the revenge. My last year of middle school, I introduced my best friend, whom I'm going to call Lily, to one of my arts classmates, who I'm going to call Trashy. They dated for around seven years, all through high school and uni, until she found, right after graduation, that Trashy had been cheating on her with his classmate from uni, Catty Cat. Lily and Trashy took language lessons at a small school next to a big shopping mall, and after their breakup, I went with her there so she could cancel her classes. I've been giving her grand speeches about how life would take care of teaching the guy a lesson, all this rubbish. After being done with cancellation fees, papers, and all, we went into the mall for a feel-better dessert. And guess who was there at the food courts? Trashy, who spotted me and Lily right away, and Catty Cat, who looked as white as a ghost. Trashy literally dragged Catty Cat towards us. We were both frozen because, can you believe it? And forced Catty Cat, who clearly wanted to be anywhere but there, to greet Lily and ask Lily, Are you not going to talk to me? all the while with a disgusting grin. I pulled Lily from there without a word. We left them all, walked to the bus stop, all in silence. After I digested what had just happened, I told Lily, you know what I said about life? Forget it. It's going to take too long. I know what I did afterwards was illegal, and only later would I realize how catastrophic it could have been. Lily still had all of Trashy's passwords, 
bank account, email, cell phone, etc. And he had hers. As soon as we got home, she'd been staying with me since the breakup. I made her change all her passwords and asked her for his emails. That's all I wanted. In our country, WhatsApp is the most used social media and we often set it to backup daily into our Google Drive or Gmail. Trashy had his backup on Gmail. I skimmed through two years worth of conversation with Catty Cat, complete with pictures and audio files and screenshot or cropped out the most interesting parts such as them talking about sex in the restrooms and emergency exit at Trashy's work during his shift, bragging about how they blinded their SOs to have their escapades. It turns out Catty Cat was married. Now, I was going to send the clippings of Doom to Trashy's family. He was their golden boy. But I got a better idea after learning how bad they'd fricked up. So I tracked down Trashy's boss on LinkedIn, got his work email, found Catty Cat's husband on Facebook, and using a throwaway account, sent them the bomb. I heard through the grapevine that Trashy got fired, but cried literally for a second chance and was on probation at work. One more F up and bye bye. Not the outcome that I wanted, but meh. Fast forward a few months. I was talking to my cousin and she was telling me about how her fiance's colleague was traveling all over the world. And he recently posted some pictures at a bar made of ice and she wanted to travel there too. She showed me the picture the guy had posted. Lo and behold, traveling colleague was Catty Cat's ex-husband, Rick. I asked her how she knew Rick and she told me he was her fiance's friend and work colleague. I didn't tell her about my shenanigans, only said that Rick's ex-wife and my best friend's ex had cheated on her. And inconspicuously, I hope, asked my cousin how Rick was, how it must have been a sad breakup for him, and did she spill the tea? So, Catty Cat had introduced Rick to Trashy during her graduation ceremony a few weeks before I sent the bomb, saying, look, this is the friend who helped me with my graduation project. Rick had allowed Trashy and Catty Cat to use his computer at home for said project, It turns out they were screwing on his bed while he was working his butt off to pay for her sorry one. And she made him shake hands with her lover. Rick was a programmer. Catty Cat was from the countryside. And she'd been living in the city with him for a few years. Rick had an awesome salary. He paid for everything so Catty Cat could focus on uni. But one day, he received some evidence that his wife was cheating on him. With the guy he'd shaken hands. The same guy he allowed to use his computer in his house to help his wife do her graduation project. Rick got her graduation dress, set it on fire, shoved her into the car, drove all the way to her family's home in the countryside, and reportedly dragged her into her parents' house by the hair, made her kneel, and tell her mother and father what she'd been doing. Her father was so distressed, he had a minor stroke, and her mother kicked her out and cut her off from the family. As far as I know, last I checked was five years ago, they were still no contact. Rick threw her out of the house. She moved in with Trashy's family, and Rick, now with his salary, Trashy X Free, was living La Vida Loca, going to ice bars in neighboring countries. And I was desperate. Had Rick been 1% madder, he could have burned her along with the dress. Her father could have died after my interference. I didn't calculate how Rick could react at all. I called Lily, told her all about it, lost my sleep over it for weeks, and even considered confessing to what I did. Lily asked me to let it go. What was done was done, to take this as a lesson and let life run its course the next time, as I'd initially said it would. I'm not proud of it, and even though I don't lose sleep over it anymore, I still feel somewhat guilty. Confessing here is kind of cathartic though. Okay, it's one thing cheating on your partner. I mean, that's pretty bad. I think we can all agree. But then to do that and then introduce your partner to the person that you're cheating on them with and have them shake hands is actually crazy. Like the level of psycho that you must have to be to do that is actually nuts. And the fact they both did it as well, they genuinely said, no, I want you to meet the person that I'm cheating on you with. It's unbelievable. It really is. That might be the most shocking thing in this entire story to me. I mean, I don't even care that someone almost died, had a stroke. The fact that someone would do that, wow. And also, OP, it's not your fault that it could have gone a lot worse. Like, them cheating was the reason why this happened. Them cheating is the reason why the dad had a mini stroke. It's not you telling them. It's not you making Rick know that it happened. Like, yeah, you did the right thing by letting everyone know and telling Rick what was going on. The fact that her dad had that reaction is because of his daughter's actions. It's nothing to do with you. And also, I know you say at the end, or at least Lily has said next time just let nature take its course i don't know i feel like cheaters need to be called out right what might have happened if you hadn't called them out yes the dad nearly died but again we've said that's not your fault so rick had to know didn't he i i think you did the right thing there personally let me know what you think down below in the comments now before we get into our next story i have a very special announcement for you after an insane amount of demand from you guys i'm delighted to say that i've released some limited edition not today karen merch picture this you're out and about in the streets and a wild karen appears and starts confronting you what do you do well normally you have to talk to a witch like this however get one of these t-shirts or hoodies on and all you have to do is simply point to it laugh and walk away 
How easy is that? The link is down in the description if you like what you see. Go ahead, check the stuff out. I think they'd make a great Christmas present or even just a little gift for yourself. As always, it's official stuff from the very best supplier, so the quality is unmatched and it's one of the best ways to support me and the channel. With that being said, let's carry on. Never safe to badger. As an apprentice, during the early days of my career, I worked for a no-nonsense Italian master marble installers. During one of the first big projects I was on, they were installing 8 by 20 centimeter Italian bone stone on the side of a brand perfect. All the huge pallets were stacked in one area, and after finally clearing customs from Italy, sitting on the dock for 110 days, three of us were charged with keeping the installers in materials. Holy heck, they were installing like madmen, and we were busting bulls. Whenever a guy had to wait more than a minute or two, he would start yelling in Italian, Andiamo, andiamo, stupido cretino. Let's go, let's go, stupid moron. Nice. Side note, my father was off the boat from Campobasso, Italy, so I knew what was up. At the same time, the so-called bank safe guys were also on site. Seemed there was a stupid visor, an older gentleman and his nitwits, Bluto like son. He reminded me of non-General Zod's slow lackey. After three weeks of listening to the dad berate and badger his son, we'd all just about had enough of his trash. This was evident during one lunchtime when a tree frog jumped out of one marble crate. The idiot dad grabs a gallon of muriatic acid sitting there, pours some into a plastic cup, and proceeds to drop the frog into it, bellowing an evil laugh. Oh look, an Italiano frog. Here's what we do to them here in America. As luck would have it, the frog merely jumped the F out of that cup and right onto the guy. Holy heck, he starts screaming as the acid is all over him. He runs out to the hose and starts drenching himself. While he's out there, all the other guys agree that he's just a POS and the son was the prez of that club. Okay, another week goes by and all the trades were behind schedule. Our marble crew was on our final leg and the very last pallet was behind this god awful huge deposit safe still packed on a pallet. I couldn't even get around to it to offload it by hand. I politely asked the kid if he could move it and he snaps, better ask my dad. Ugh, so I go and find him. Again, politely inquire and he snaps, I'll move it when I'm good and ready. You think you're more important than us? Can't you see we're busy? Who the frick do you think you people are? You people? Hmm. Marble setters, Italians, guys in Harley shirts, I don't know. So I go and tell the installers who are already getting agitated and oh boy, the one guy starts yelling at the son in Italian and the father is yelling back at the guy. I may not understand you, but I know you're calling him bad names. How about this? F you, huh? Understand that? Huh? F you and your trashy marble. So then the stupid visor's number is on the wall and we call and he calls. And finally, the son begrudgingly and ever so slowly moves the freaking pallet. The entire rest of that day, the two of them were hollering, disparaging remarks about us. We wanted to strangle the both of them, as you can imagine. At the very end of the job on a Friday afternoon, us apprentices were breaking down the wet saw and cleaning up all our debris. While tossing garbage, I overhear the dad hollering at the sun. Okay, I'm leaving, so don't screw this up. When the cement truck gets here, don't let him pour until you check the electric meter in front of the driver. Be sure he sees the reading, okay? Got it? He must see the reading, okay? I'm asking one thing. Don't screw this up. And off he goes. No idea I heard this entire exchange. Now, what he's talking about is this. When they install these huge stainless steel deposit safes into the wall of a new bank, they wrap the entire thing in about 200 feet of cable wire. So if anyone tries to chip their way in, it will trigger the alarm damn thing resembles a rubber band ball when it's finished. Before they encase the entire kit and caboodle with high strength number one concrete, the safe guys clip test wires to each end to be sure there is contact for the alarm guys as there will be zero way to repair it after the pour. Everyone is gone but the son and myself. The truck pulls up. The kid, all boss-like, approaches the driver and over the roar of the truck, he hollers, you have to witness the meter read. The guy's unimpressed. Yeah, whatever. The dimwit attaches the leads and it shows positive conductivity and he shows the driver. When he looks at it, I really don't think he knew what he was even looking at and snorts, okay, I guess. The kid's all proud and screams, let it go. And while the guy is positioning the shoe over the framed in deposit safe, I go around back and take my trusty gerber plier multi-tool and just reach in there and start cutting wires. I cut a half dozen and floofed up the wires to cover it. Less than three minutes later, the entire thing was covered and encased in the concrete. The next day we show up and there's the father, the son, the stupid visor, the concrete guy, the contractor, the alarm guy, and four suits standing around this meter, 
taking turns assigning blame. The best part we heard was the father screaming about getting paid and the contractor refusing until that circuit showed positive. And we all know that's not going to happen. Now, normally I'm not a vindictive kind of guy, but this incident was different. I felt I was representing all the guys on site that were badgered by these idiots. Not sure of the final ending, but that bank opened on time and the exterior marble looks magnificent. I smile each and every time I drive by it. And there we go. I'm not entirely sure, to be honest, who exactly had to pay for all of this. I assume it was the father and son though as they were contracted to do the work and they didn't fulfill their contract so i assume they never got paid maybe the bank had to pay eventually anyway but as long as the father and son didn't get any money then i'm i'm satisfied that's for sure or maybe they never actually realized and they just were like oh screw it let's do it so that means that if you ever come across this atm i don't know where it would be but hey maybe you can work it out somehow you can just get into it and take all the money without causing the alarm to go off. Yeah, it seems unlikely, but you never know. Cheat on me with my best friend. I'll wreck your career and publicly humiliate both of you. Shathid and Sarah have been like family to my wife and I for several years, practically ever since we moved in across the street from them. The four of us were extremely tight. Our kids are the same age as theirs and are all good friends. We were one big family unit. We did dinner together a few times a week. We went on vacations together. I truly saw Shathid as a brother and my wife and Sarah were very close too. Five months ago, I was completely blindsided by the discovery of an affair between my wife and Shathid. My wife had left her email open on our computer and I saw an email from her to her longtime therapist saying that Shathid would be joining her at an upcoming session again. Uh, what the frick? My mind started racing. Why in the world would Shathid be going to her therapy sessions without my knowledge? I did a search and found some other emails to and from the therapist proving that Shathid had been going to sessions together with her for about six weeks. I checked our mobile phone account and discovered that since late summer, they've been exchanging hundreds of texts every day, peaking at nearly 500 per day by the holidays. Speaking of the holidays, my wife and I hosted both of our families, parents, siblings, etc., for both Thanksgiving and Christmas dinner. And Shathid and Sarah joined us either for dinner or after dinner on both holidays. Text records show that the entire time that they were at our house celebrating with our families, my wife and Shathid were texting each other across the room. They were doing that pretty much every time the four of us hung out for months. And, you know, all day, every day, just in general. But what bothers me the most is that they were doing it with Sarah and I right there. I confronted my wife with the evidence and she admitted that, yes, she and Shathid had fallen in love. It just happened. I don't know how, but I love him and I just don't feel anything for you anymore. I'm sorry. They'd gone on a school district trip together. Something had happened in her hotel room and things had moved quickly from there. She explained as I lay face down on the couch, unable to look at her, that they'd already made plans to move out and divorce me and Sarah. And while they didn't plan to move in together immediately because of the kids, they'd probably do so eventually. The meetings with the therapist were supposedly mostly for the purpose of finding a way to break this to me and Sarah as gently as possible because they were so very concerned for our well-being. Sarah and I are fairly certain that they weren't planning on telling us about the affair at all and were simply going to discover their feelings for one another several months down the line after they come up with some other reason to divorce the two of us. Yeah, I have to agree here. That seems way more likely. I can't believe what she's saying. Oh, we were so concerned for your guys' health and well-being that we weren't going to tell you about the brutal affair we were having in front of your eyes. My wife moved out about two months ago. I was and still am utterly destroyed. I cry every day. I cried right in the first few paragraphs of this story just now. I worry nonstop about the impact on our kids, but I'm also not exactly a shrinking violet when I feel that I've been wronged. And in this case, I was, objectively, very, very wronged. So a couple of years ago, Shathid ran for a board of education seat as a pretty extreme underdog. I helped him with his campaign materials and debate prep, and my wife, a well-known school district employee, this becomes important later, got the word out as best she could. Much to our surprise, he actually won in a squeaker by just a few dozen votes. Being on the board became the center of Shathid's world. He joined every committee that he could. This turned into the foundation of his affair with my wife, as they were constantly going to school events and meetings together on evenings and weekends. Once I discovered the affair, my thoughts turned pretty quickly to revenge, and it occurred to me that an extramarital affair between a member of the Board of Education and an employee of the school district was at least bad politics, and it possibly violated district policy. Making things far worse for them was that my wife was in the running for an open administrative position, and everyone knew that she was more or less guarantee the job and the major pay raise that came with it. She just finished her master's degree in school administration at the urging of her principal and the superintendent so that she could be promoted to this specific position. I had plenty of evidence of the affair. Text from both of them admitting to it, text records showing that they were texting hundreds of times a day, emails to and from the therapist, etc. 
I considered simply emailing all of the evidence to the board and the superintendent, but felt like I, as the grieving, betrayed spouse, might not be seen as a credible source. So instead, I invented a fictitious, furious friend who was planning on showing up to the next board meeting and publicly shaming the two of them for their affair. I told my wife that I'd tried to talk this person down, but couldn't guarantee that they wouldn't show up and humiliate them publicly. As I expected, this led Shafi to conclude that the only option was for him to preemptively admit the affair to the board. The superintendent subsequently recommended that Shithid resign, which he did. Sarah said that he was utterly humiliated and crushed and barely got out of bed for a few days afterwards. Once word of the affair and Shithid's resignation started getting around, the superintendent, a longtime friend of both my wife and Shithid, contacted my wife and tearfully informed her that it was no longer politically appropriate for her to be promoted to an administrative position within the district. The position that had been lined up for her was later filled by an outside candidate. This sent waves of confusion and rumor throughout the district as it was pretty well known that my wife was getting the job. The day after she was informed that she wasn't getting the promotion, my wife and I, despite our crumbling marriage, took our son out to breakfast together on his birthday and her parents stopped by our table to congratulate her on her new role. She said thanks, then excused herself to go cry in the bathroom for a while. I let the dust settle for a couple of weeks and then right before my wife moved out, let them in on my little secret. There was never a furious friend threatening to expose them in the first place. Just me. Word of all of this had gone around our fairly small town, which Shathid grew up in and my wife has worked in for nearly 20 years. My wife refuses to talk to me about how things are at work now, but I've heard from some people I know in the district that her formerly spotless reputation has taken a major hit. Shathid, formerly a gregarious social presence in our neighborhood and at events and pubs in town, has completely gone underground and barely emerges to mow his lawn. He's moving out soon to a trashy little townhouse, which is all he can afford due to all the child support he's going to have to pay his wife. My wife and Shathid claim that they plan on trying to make things work together, despite all the public humiliation. I wish them lots of luck with that. I'm sure it'll be a lot of fun to show their faces together in town. And there we go. That is the conclusion of the post. But before we get into some analysis and commentary, OP has actually answered a couple of questions. First of all, are you and Sarah a thing now? You should totally be a thing. That would be awesome. No, we're friends. We've been incredibly important to each other since this all started and have certainly gotten a lot closer, but not in the way everyone's thinking. This would all be so much harder to deal with if I didn't have her to lean on and she says she feels the same way about me. We're going through basically the exact same situation with the same players, after all. Shathid hasn't moved out yet. Once he does, we plan to go back to getting the kids together more often like they're used to. It'll never be the same, of course. She already does come over with the kids from time to time, but it's just tough with Shathid's constant presence across the street. Next question. Didn't your revenge hurt both sets of kids? Well, not really. Shathid has a day job. The board of education was his hobby and his passion, but this didn't affect his income at all. And my wife has been assured that if she wants to pursue an administrative position with another district, she'll have glowing letters of recommendation from her superintendent and principal. It'll mean giving up a lot of work relationships in the process, but given the hit her reputation has taken, I'm guessing she makes that jump sooner rather than later. In the meantime, not moving to an administrative job means that she still has summers off with the kids. Third question, why do you call her your wife instead of your former wife? Well, we're working our way through divorce mediation, but it isn't final yet. We'll be soon. And then the final question, why didn't you notice all of the texting your wife was doing? Well, I did. It was really starting to annoy me. It was excessive. She has a big social circle and does tend to text a lot anyway, but it was really getting over the top. At one point in November, I asked her to agree to a no phones at the dinner table rule, which she agreed to reluctantly, but would then pout through dinner and eventually she just started using her phone during dinner again. All that said, I was blind. Not only was the texting getting weird, but her relationship with Shathid was starting to make me uncomfortable. Sarah noticed it too and agreed. We actually confronted them a couple of times about it directly and they both swore up and down that it was just school stuff they were talking about, nothing else was going on and for whatever reason, we believed them probably because the mind tends to refuse to see things that it doesn't want to see. Now, incredibly, the post I've just read there was posted over four years ago on Reddit on r slash pro revenge. However, just a few days ago, OP posted an update. That's right, an update on a pro revenge story that's over four years old. I don't think I've ever seen anything like it before, but stay tuned because that is coming up. Now, as for this initial story on its own, my thoughts are this. First of all, how exceptionally sad. These two are just disgusting. I mean, look, cheating is one thing, right? And we can all agree that's a pretty bad thing to do but cheating in front of your partners together in the same room like messaging and texting when your wife and your husband respectively 
are there is actually nuts. How can you, how can you with any sort of conscience do that? I have no idea. Like, I'm not going to lie. I struggle to understand how people cheat in the first place, unless they're in a really like dark place mentally, to be honest with you, or they just feel like they have no other option. I mean, genuinely, I've never done it and I don't see myself ever doing it. Maybe that's a naive thing to say. I don't know. But this is one step further. Doing it knowing that your partner is in the same room as you. It's unbelievable. And then as I mentioned during that story, because I just simply had to mention it at that point, the fact that you've said, oh no, we were trying to work out how to tell you, but we knew it would really hurt you. So we just didn't tell you. Like, is that not the most dumb logic you've ever heard in your life? For me, it's gotta be. As for your revenge OP, I've gotta say, genius. Making them self-destruct themselves is great because it just means that you didn't have to do anything. Like they did it for you. Lovely stuff. Anyway, with that being said, Let's get on to this update four years later, just literally a few days ago at the time of recording. Now, before we get into our next story, I have a very special announcement for you. After an insane amount of demand from you guys, I'm delighted to say that I've released some limited edition Not Today Karen merch. Picture this, you're out and about in the streets and a wild Karen appears and starts confronting you. What do you do? Well, normally you have to talk to a witch like this. However, get one of these t-shirts or hoodies on and all you have to do is simply point to it, laugh, and walk away. How easy is that? The link is down in the description if you like what you see. Go ahead, check the stuff out. I think they'd make a great Christmas present or even just a little gift for yourself. As always, it's official stuff from the very best supplier, so the quality is unmatched and it's one of the best ways to support me and the channel. With that being said, let's carry on. So, where to start? It's been a bizarre few years, especially with COVID thrown in the mix, which I somehow still have never caught, despite my kids getting it twice each. Thankfully, just mild cases. Well, at the time that I posted the original story, I was obviously a wreck. Things actually got significantly darker for a while after that. My ex decided to start bringing Shathid around our kids just a few months after she moved out, which was really hard for me to deal with. I'd never really dealt with serious depression before, but things got bad enough that my doctor more or less forced me to start on an antidepressant because I admitted to him that I was thinking about suicide pretty frequently. I think this is where I should mention trigger warning for the rest of this paragraph. I actually had a very specific plan and everything I needed to do it. The one thing that gave me any kind of relief was telling myself that if life got any more unbearable, I had a way out. So yeah, it got bad, but I'm still here. And thankfully I don't think about that option anymore. I reluctantly decided to dip my toe into the online dating world. And after a number of short-term things that didn't pan out, I actually connected with someone. We'll have been together for two years next month. She is absolutely amazing. We don't live together. And for the time being, we're both good with seeing each other a few times a week. Would I love to see her more? Yep. Am I ready to live with someone again and go all Brady Bunch with our respective kids? I'm not sure. For the time being, we have a lot of fun together and that's more than good enough for me. As far as things stand with my ex and Shathid, they're still together, but there seems to be trouble in paradise because my kids report that they almost never see him anymore. My kids don't like him at all and they just avoid him when he's around, according to my older one. When all of this started, she'd seem confident that they'd be living together pretty soon, but they still don't. And as far as I know, there are no plans in the works for it. They did buy a boat together, which I find hilarious for some reason. It just seems like the classic affair couple thing to do. Sarah took a long time to accept that her marriage was truly over. But once she did, she really did an admirable job of moving on. She engrossed herself in home improvement projects. She remains the same incredible mum that she's always been. And she's been in a FWB type relationship, which is all she wants right now, with a nice funny guy for almost two years. We hang out here and there, especially when my pool is open in the summer. We aren't nearly as dependent on each other as we were in the beginning, but we're still close friends. And no, still nothing more than that, which I'm glad about, because the one thing this situation definitely never needed was more drama. My ex left the school district she was working for and took a job in a neighboring district. I've no idea what Shathid is up to, nor do I care. I hardly ever see him except at the occasional school event. For a while there, I was worried that he'd look at me the wrong way and I'd wind up in jail for knocking him out in an elementary school cafeteria or something. But I just don't care enough about him anymore for that to be a concern. So all in all, life is pretty okay right now. I do miss being a family. I still have nightmares about all of this stuff and deal with intrusive thoughts at times. I fall asleep to audiobooks now to keep those thoughts at bay. Otherwise, I still struggle to sleep sometimes. But my girlfriend is amazing. I have an incredibly supportive family. I just officiated my sister's wedding a couple of months ago. And I have a big dog who needs lots of walks. And that's a huge help for me on so many levels. And if you're lucky enough to be watching on YouTube, here is your dog tax. Look at that cute little dog. I mean, to be fair, it's actually quite a sizable dog. Very cute nonetheless. And if you're not on YouTube and you want to come and see the dog, 
Link is down in the description. So there we go. I tell you what, I really enjoy that update because it's very rare that we get an update like that, especially so long after the actual event takes place. And I love the honesty of it as well, because you see some of these stories and then people are like, oh yeah, now I feel great again. But let's be honest, like going through that sort of an event that would change your life so much for the worst at first anyway, is going to have such a lasting impact. I love the honesty of OP saying it actually got worse before it got better. And they went to a really, really dark place. And even now, four years later, they still to listen to audiobooks to help them sleep at night because you know it makes sense you wouldn't expect someone to be like oh yeah now i'm amazing best i've ever felt ideally they'd be in that spot but it just seems a bit unlikely to me that someone would be like oh i'm so much better now just the few months years whatever afterwards yeah love the honesty i mean look, i'm not saying eventually that op won't get to that spot and i really hope he does and sarah does as well and it seems like you've moved on to a significant level but yeah you'd still be deeply hurt by this i'm sure for a good amount of time afterwards and it's nice to see someone actually admit that and there we go guys that is gonna do it for this one really hope you enjoyed that three hours of the very best nuclear revenge stories of the past couple of months you guys seem to love these compilation style movie length videos and episodes that i do so as long as you keep loving them i'm gonna keep making them they are at the moment the most successful videos on the channel and on the podcast platforms by a long way so we're gonna keep them going and guys as always thank you very much and i'll see you on the next one